probably know the money. Ladies and gentlemen, no, the mic's not working. Mine is. I just want to make sure. Is it good to go? Mine's live. Use that mic for right now. Okay. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I want to say thank you, all of you, for attending. I know it's a standing room only crowd, and we are so appreciative that you would take the time to be able to join us uh, for this joint committee of uh, the Calvin Dungeness and Rock Crab Fishery hearing. Uh, we're going to be focused today on public health ocean conditions and maintaining a strong coastal economy and of course uh, we are just so appreciative of all of you uh, for attending uh, today. Um, my name is Mike McGuire. Uh, I'm grateful to chair uh, the Joint Committee on Fisheries and Aquaculture and to be able to work with uh, our esteemed Vice Chair Assemblymember Jim Wood. So thank you very much Mr. Wood to be here and it's good to see you. Uh, Assemblymember Wood and I uh, represent a vast and beautiful stretch of the California coastline. Uh, Mr. Wood's district runs from Sonoma County to the Oregon border, and I represent 40% uh, of California's magnificent coast from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border. Our districts are considered California crab country. The North Coast is home to the vast majority of the crab fleet, of course spread throughout the state as well, uh, and the majority of annual crab tonnage in the Golden State comes and is harvested and processed in the many ports that dot Northern California. Dungeness crab is part of coastal California's identity and history. 
The first documented commercial crab harvest happened in the late 1840s, uh, right off the coast of San Francisco. And ever since, generations of families have been braving the cold Pacific to harvest in what many consider to be one of our nation's most robust crab fisheries. Several coastal communities up and down this state, including Santa Cruz County, Santa Barbara County, Del Norte, Humboldt, Mendocino, Sonoma, and Marin counties are dependent on a healthy crab harvest for their economic well-being. The Dungeness crab fishery is in the top tier of California's commercial fisheries. Values have exceeded $95 million per year, and long-term averages are about $60 million per year. So when North Coast and California crab tested with high levels of naturally occurring toxin, great concern reigned throughout the California fleet. That said, tough times traditionally brings out the best in people. And fishermen, industry leaders, and public officials all came together as partners to call for a delayed opening to the crab season to ensure the public safety. Delaying the opening of the crab season is not a decision that is taken lightly. Um, livelihoods of local crab fishermen, their families and crews in thousands across California will be adversely impacted by what could be a costly and extended delay. And of course, our dinner tables throughout the holiday season could potentially be impacted as well. And I gotta say, I think I can speak for many of us in this room, we love to enjoy one of California's great delicacies in traditional nat natural foods, and that's fresh crab. But there is nothing more important than the public's health and safety, and I wanna say thank you to the industry for coming together and focusing on that issue. This industry, as we know, sinks or swims based on consumer confidence. This is why we all wanna be absolutely sure the California crab that you share this holiday season and always is not only delicious, but healthy and safe. The problem this vital industry is facing this past year is caused by unusually high ocean temperatures. These high temperatures have caused large and persistent algae blooms, which in turn have caused high acid levels in California's Dungeness and rock crab. Fortunately though, when ocean temperatures drop, acid levels will drop too, and Dungeness and rock crab will once again be safe to eat again. The state continues to conduct extensive tests each week on the acid levels, but frankly, the tests have been fluctuating week to week, which we'll hear about, and we have not been able to get a consistent positive trend. And that is why we are here today. This forum is bringing together an incredible cast of state agency leaders, scientists, and industry experts together in one location, focused on protecting the public's health, ocean conditions, and of course, we need to focus on our crab-dependent coastal economy. We're gonna hear how state agencies are collecting the samples, we'll learn the standards and procedures for testing crab meat, and the mechanisms for reopening the fishery. Our panel of experts will discuss the current status of crab, domoic acid impacts, ocean conditions, and what to expect in the weeks ahead and the impacts of the season delay. We also hope to get to the bottom of questions many in California are asking. Are these unusually high water temperatures due to what many call the Godzilla El Nino? Uh, are temperatures a mix between El Nino, exasperated by climate change? Is this a new normal? And why, despite the fact we saw higher than normal temperatures off of our coast last year, didn't we experience the algae blooms that we're seeing now? The delayed start to the season, particularly a longer term delay, has far reaching impacts for thousands of Californians. All of us are hoping for the best, but we also need to start planning for the worst case scenario. And this means we need to start developing a plan for financial assistance for those who are dependent on the crab fishery. The majority of crab in California is consumed Thanksgiving through New Year's, with the vast majority being consumed around the Christmas holiday. If we see an unprecedented delay, which we do not want to see, but if we do, that takes us past the holiday season, we would be experiencing a near collapse of the commercial crab season. And today is December 3rd, and we are running out of daylight to get this season kicked off in time for the holiday window. The planning for financial assistance needs to start today. And I know I could speak for Assemblymember Wood, 
We are grateful for the collaboration between our state agencies and the industry. And we look forward to the conversation this afternoon. And we want to thank all of our panelists for attending. Uh, we would ask that you um, not only identify problems, but also administrative and legislative solutions that may improve the current and future processes for opening our crab fisheries throughout California. Our bottom line, we want to make sure California crab is safe to eat and to get Northern California crabbers on the water and back to work. Again, thank you all of you for attending. I know many of you have traveled from far and wide to be here today. And we also want to thank the thousands of folks who are now watching online via live cast. I'd now like to be able to turn it over to uh, my partner here, uh, and that's Vice Chairman Assemblymember Wood to make his opening statement. Thank you so much, Assemblymember. Thank you, Senator McGuire. My, my comments will be brief. Uh, thank you to everyone for, for participating today and attending this hearing in our home district where the crab fishery is one of the top commodities of California's commercial fisheries and, and for, from a community and from an economic standpoint. California's crab industry is a critical part of our economy and an important indicator of the health of our offshore waters. It's obviously a devastating blow to the North Coast fishermen who have spent weeks gearing up for what they had hoped to be a profitable season on top of a pretty dismal salmon season, quite frankly. Um, the delay in opening crab season will impact the livelihoods of the local fishermen in both my, mine and the Senator's district and, and throughout the coast of California. I hope and believe that this hearing will provide every participant an important opportunity to bring their expert knowledge to the table for a constructive discussion and how best to solve this problem going forward. It's, cru it's crucial that we know that we know what we need to expect for the rest of the crab season and what to be prepared for in the future to ensure that we will be able to address this head on. I'm looking forward to hearing from the panelists on ways to resolve these conflicts that impact the crabbing industry and uh, very much looking forward to the comments we have going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, we uh, would like to be able to uh, introduce and bring up Joan Dintler. She is a field representative for Senator Jerry Hill, who represents uh, the great city of San Mateo. Unfortunately, he has another meeting today. Uh, he is a member of this uh, joint committee. And Ms. Dintler will be offering a statement on behalf of Senator Hill. Thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon, my name is Joan Dentler and I'm a field representative, as Senator McGuire said, for Senator Jerry Hill, who represents the San Mateo County coastline, including Pillar Point Harbor, which is our district's most robust crab fishery. Senator Hill is unable to be here today, but he thanks Senator McGuire and Assemblymember Wood and other members of the committee for hosting this important hearing. We are facing a critical situation that is threatening our coastal communities and it's imperative that all levels of government are ready to take action if the crab season remains closed. We need to be prepared for a variety of options to deal with this unique situation, such as modifying the opening day so commercial fishermen aren't further impacted, and in worst case scenario, to be able to provide financial relief since the livelihoods of thousands of Californians are at stake. I appreciate all of the government and industry representatives here today, and I look forward to continued collaboration and solutions as the season progresses. Thank you. Thank you so much, and it is great to see you, and please thank Senator Hill for his service as well. All right, thank you. Good to see you. Happy holidays. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be encouraging public comment. Uh, we are going to be having public comment at the end of our agenda after each of the panels uh, have advanced. Uh, and each speaker will have three minutes to be able to address the committee. Uh, we have a three-hour window, and I do know that individuals have meetings to attend this evening. Uh, I will be asking each individual to be able to keep it to about four to five minutes. Uh, please don't take me trying to be pushy uh, as being rude. Uh, I just want to make sure that we have time for all of our panelists and uh, what is also just as important to be able to hear from all of you this afternoon. And again, thank you so much for traveling to Santa Rosa today uh, to be able to attend this important hearing. Uh, quick housekeeping, restrooms are straight out the exit. Take a right, it's going to be on your left-hand side at the end of the hall, and we are offended that uh, folks are not eating the cookies and coffee uh, that are in the back, so please help yourself as well. So without further ado, I'd like to be able to turn it over to uh, the Director of Fish and Wildlife, 
Uh, I got to say, Mr. Bonham has one of the toughest jobs in Sacramento. And since uh, his reign as the director, he has had a lot on his plate. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the director for your incredible work. Uh, he comes to us as a fisheries expert in his previous career. Um, and he is going to be talking about fish and wildlife's perspective. The Department of Fish and Wildlife manages the commercial fishery in California, and they collaborate with public health and the environmental health hazard assessment on testing of Dungeness crab on a commercial basis. Mr. Bonham, the floor is yours, and we are grateful that you're attending today. Great. Thank you, Senator Assemblymember Wood. I was operating off your November email invitation to take 10 to 15 minutes, so I'm please. in my head yes. scrambling to take get it. to four. No. Thank you. No, 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 please no. take it to 10 please. minutes. But in the spirit of uh, being expeditious, let me go straight to my bottom line. Uh, I'm upset. I'm not happy either. This is a situation that is causing real harm to people we care about at our department, who primarily are some of our longest running partners in a, an arena which is mostly our department's jurisdiction. It is also hurting personally. I'm a proud father of a native Californian young boy. I'm not sure he and I will be able to stand in a long line at our great local seafood market and get our annual crab for our meal. But public health and safety have to come first. I can say that as director, I'm intent on our department doing whatever it takes to get seasons opened as soon as Mother Nature allows it and the data and science supports it. So let me offer some context, knowing Commissioner Scalar will cover more recreational relative to the Fish and Game Commission our colleagues in public health are likely to cover the actual toxin involved, the risk, our sampling approaches, and Ms. Coleman will be taking a broader look at ocean health. So we're talking about two species, rock crab, of which there are three, yellow, brown, and red. This commercial fishery for rock crab occurs primarily in Southern California, south of Morro Bay. There's some north, but primarily south of Morro Bay. We don't have a major recreational fishery on rock crab yet. And over time, the commercial crabbing on rock crab has expanded from nearshore areas close to some of our proximate ports in that region, like San Diego, Santa Barbara, San, uh, San Pedro, towards more distant, uh, offshore, or even in the Channel Island activity. There is no closed season for rock crab. So it's open year round, both recreational and commercially. There are about 160 permits, about 122 are in the southern part of the state. And in 14, I think the landings were 2.3 million pounds worth about 3.5 million. Shift over to Dungeness. I think one sentence sums up Dungeness. They are iconic. In fact, the fishery began in the Bay, San Francisco, contemporaneous to Gold Rush, and the legislature took a management interest in them in 1895. You see one of the first codes in our statute show up in 1897 where y'all, your predecessors, prohibited the take of female crabs. It's a complicated management structure in the best of years, right? We divide the waters in two regions. There's a demarcation line at the Sonoma-Mendocino County border. North is Northern District, South is Central Management Area. I know most in the audience understand this, but we have a lot of viewers, we're streaming online, who may not know this. We have a statutory scheme. We have new legislation over the decades, including most recently in 2011 where we have trap limits. We've kept an, a Dungeness Crab Task Force through the facilitation of the Ocean Protection Council. And for what it's worth, our department cares so much about you in the audience, 
I'm actually personally named in federal litigation defending the structure you've created to protect Dungeness Crab for the commercial fleet in California. So it's my name on the lawsuit defending the structure you've created for the benefit of all of y'all in the audience. On top of that, we get a tri-state commission. We're compelled to work with Oregon and Washington and sort it out. So each year for me personally is hectic anyway because we're testing quality and figuring out when to open. What's unprecedented is the current situation on top of it. Let me shift to that current situation, knowing time is short. So in early summer of 2015, we had an unprecedented toxic algae bloom. Uh, it stretches from California, possibly up to Alaska. The bloom involves microscopic algae. So the tiniest living thing, a single cell, is actually producing huge impacts, right? Um, it bioaccumulates in shellfish and smaller fish. Turns out, it looks like it comes into anchovies and sardines faster and moves through their systems quicker than it may on crab, coming in later and taking longer to run out. And it will move through as waters cool. It could be related to the warm water of the blob, might be caused by El Nino. We are thinking through what's the difference between causation and correlation to uncover these issues as well. Annually, we coordinate with the, De Public, the Department of Public Health for monitoring of biotoxins anyway. So mid-October, we started discussions with the, De the Department of Public Health, our colleagues at the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, which was then California EPA, about the status of domoic acids and a possible delay of the Dungeness crab fishery. The beginning of November, I think November 3rd, we got a health advisory from the Department of Public Health. That same afternoon, I believe it was, we got a transmittal memo from OWEA, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard, excuse me, Health Hazard Assessment, recommending both a delay of the recreational and the commercial Dungeness crab fisheries, and a closure of the rock crab fishery north of Ventura, Santa Barbara line. That work was updated November 6th with additional sampling protocol coming in from Santa Barbara. On Thursday of this week, November 5th, our commission held an emergency meeting to close uh, the recreational Dungeness crabs, excuse me, delay the opener on the Dungeness uh, crab and close the rock crab fishery. Then that Friday, our department took action to implement an emergency rulemaking. We delayed the commercial opener uh, for Dungeness and we closed the rock crab. There are several statutory provisions at play here we could talk about later. We are engaged in the sampling currently. Uh, I would note that there is some concern primarily in the Santa Barbara area. How do you figure out a sampling spatial scale and frequency that addresses all parties' concerns? Many want us sampling in their immediate area. We're trying to think coast-wide, in partnership, major areas and looking for trend analysis. Some parties want us narrowed in in their particular home waters. We understand that tension. Um, I would say we'll talk more about sampling. We have spent a significant amount of time doing outreach and education. We've stood up a web page. We've been engaged actively in the media. We've created a hotline number. We've gone out to 18 ports, Trinidad, Eureka, Fields Landing, Shelter Cove, Fort Bragg, Albion, Bodega, Berkeley, Princeton, Santa Cruz, Moss Landing, Monterey, uh, Avila, Santa Barbara, Ventura, Channel Island Launch. We've put out uh, 1,000 perhaps flyers. We've canvas this area where we think we've got about 90% coverage of the people who are engaged both recreational and commercially. We've sat down with over 30 rock crab and lobster fishermen in Santa Barbara personally. Uh, we got about 4,000 people who subscribe to our alert system. So we're doing well pushing the message out. Reopening. I don't know when we will reopen. You deserve honesty. I predict that between middle of December, end of December, there will be constant 
activity between all of us here and our respective staffs. For instance, we just got sampling results this morning. Um, we see good trends, but we also see very high elevated hotspots. So our department is forced to think through these kinds of complex questions. Should we hold an open statewide? Should we think about a region-wide approach, not knowing if a crab will respect a region boundary and a great risk of a tainted product? Do we go as narrow as county by county, a flexibility we left in our emergency rulemaking, balanced against when Oregon and Washington may open, taking into consideration the fair start provisions if our boats go north out of the state, they have to wait 30 days before they come in. Or if you go south in the state, you may have to wait 30 days before you go into our northern grounds. I'm also stuck in this predicament and here, I need your help. I need the recreational leaders to sit with me and Dr. Craig Schumann in the marine region at the same time we're sitting with the commercial leaders. We're going to make this together or not. We need to find a way to have an efficient, effective, equitable start when we get there, knowing there's a recreational interest on the table, but people's livelihoods are on the table too. Let me finish with two things. Disaster declaration, true, it's a possibility. I'm thankful for the congressional letter received from our members of Congress asking Governor Brown to start thinking about it. My expectation is that the California Natural Resources Agency and Secretary Laird will be answering in writing. There is the potential for federal disaster declaration under two different federal statutes. Uh, the first is the Magnuson-Stephen Fisheries Conservation Management Act. We call it Magnuson-Stevens. The other is the Interjurisdictional Fisheries Act. Slightly different, very complimentary. The takeaway is a governor, another duly appointed person, or the Secretary of Commerce could ask for relief. Your tests are the establishment of a disaster, an allowable cause, an economic impact. We went through this in 2008 on salmon in the late 90s around ground fish. Our department was already thinking of this, frankly, before the letter came in the door. And we're actually thinking for it about rock crab as well, something not mentioned in the congressional letter. So both rock crab and Dungeness, what we have done is backcast average annual landings to start to calculate the economic impact, which will be the core. But here's the art of this question. We will not know damage until we can understand opener, delay, closure, and value produced, so we're balancing that. What have I learned? I love this job. And I'm continually revitalized by the kind of showing here in this room. Ms. Coleman mentioned to me a minute ago how hard it is to get this many fishermen together and fisherwomen to think through important issues Sadly, it's because you're not working right now. But I'm appreciative you're here, so I want to close by saying I've learned a couple of things. I think we can reform our rulemaking and our administrative work on the department side and the commission side so we don't have this last minute challenge around emergency rulemaking and going over to different state agencies to get approval before we can do closures. We've learned that in drought recently. I also think we've learned how valuable you are for monitoring. Sadly, we dealt with the largest oil spill in 25 years in the state of Santa Barbara this summer, and the Santa Barbara fleets came to our rescue, helping us and DPH and OEA do monitoring, and that's happening again this time. I think we should figure out how to memorialize that kind of structure, and I believe we need more capacity in the assets so that DPH and OEA and us can do this monitoring going forward more progressively. And I would just end with four words, maybe. And the audience is where I direct this. You may not hear this from a typical department director. The first thing I want to say to you is I'm sorry. I know this is hurting you. The other thing I'd like to say to you is thank you. 
for everything you've done and will continue to do. So let me stop there. Thank you, Senator McGuire and Assemblymember Wood. Thank you for having me today at this very important hearing. Um, it, it's, uh, I'm going to try to give you more of your time back and, and not repeat what, uh, what Chuck has said. But um, I want to start by saying um, that, uh, as Chuck said, the Department and the Commission had no choice um, but to move quickly and to, and to um, close the fishery as quickly as we did. In doing so, we didn't get to have the usual public input, either from experts or from the public, that we have in these in instances of, of decision making. So I'm especially grateful for this hearing today. I'm here as much to listen to the other people speaking in the public because we didn't get that opportunity when we had to close the fishery a few weeks ago. And on a personal note, I want to say that, um, like both of you, having served as an elected local official, I had to make a lot of tough votes uh, in my day, particularly on land use issues, as I'm sure you did as well. But I have to say that this is one of the most difficult votes I've ever had to make, notwithstanding the fact that we had no choice. Um, and it's because of what Chuck said. We were making a decision, even if it was something we had to do, that affects the livelihood of so many people and has such a great impact, um, both on the people in the industry and as it, both Senator Yu and Chuck said, uh, on the state as a whole because of this iconic, iconic uh, part of our state's history. Um, so we all at the commission took feel the real weight of this decision and like everybody else want to see this fishery opened as soon as possible. Um, so I want to reiterate uh, as you said that uh, the uh, Fish and Game Commission only oversees the recreational part of it and the department oversees the commercial. This is somewhat typical of the fishery management in California. There's a fragmented nature to it. In some instances the legislature has the direct authority over fisheries and some the department, some the commission and sometimes the federal government. Um, in general that's not a very good thing for acting quickly. But I have to say that we, none of us, none of the department, the other agencies that work with us, let that get in the way of working very quickly here to protect public health. As Chuck outlined in the time frame, we moved incredibly quickly. We're talking hours and days. Um, it was an incredible partnership and coordination between all the agencies involved um, to make sure that we protected the public health in a very short time frame. Uh, as Chuck said, it was literally 48 hours between receiving the notice of the condition and the commission making the decision to close the fishery uh, or prevent it from opening just two days later. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to tr try to skip a few of the things that, that Chuck already talked about, but I, I do want to hit on the fact that um, th this was so unique in terms of the severity, the spatial extent, and the duration of this bloom. It's really like nothing we've ever seen before. And I know the scientists will talk a little bit more about that. And normally the levels of domoic acid drop off well before either the recreational or the commercial seasons opens up. So this really is unprecedented and it's important to remember that. Um, when we got the notice, the Fish and Game Commission staff moved very quickly to assemble the commission. We ended up doing what's uh, rarely been done, which is an emergency phone call meeting, to, which is one of the reasons we couldn't have the input that we usually would. Um, and, we, uh, and we put the, uh, uh, the closure into effect right away. Um, one of the things we did in the regulation closing the fisheries was try to provide as much flexibility so that opening would happen as quickly as possible as well. Uh, and rather than having a process where the health agencies came back and asked us to act again, we would have to go through this multiple step process of noticing to open the fisheries. We've asked the fish, the, the, we've given the authority to the health department to declare that there's no longer an emergency and the fisheries can open immediately. Um, that has caused com some consternation between 
the recreational and the commercial fisheries, and I understand that, but we, it, it was the best way under very short notice to, to, prefer, to perform a, 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 legis a regulatory act that would ensure the shortest time frame from detecting the lowest levels necessary and to opening. And we'll have to address, and as Chuck said, we're going to make sure that there's fairness and equity, both at the Commission and the Department, on that opening uh, gap. Um, not only do we uh, add to flexibility so that we'd have that shorter closure time, we also allowed spatial flexibility so that if there's a big enough area that's determined to be at low enough levels, that can be open and we don't necessarily need a statewide opening. Because again, we want to get everybody back going as quickly as possible, although as Chuck said again, that can create other problems with where you, where you first, uh, first uh, drop your pots. But the most important thing is to get people back working as soon as possible and hopefully get crab on the table by the holidays if the levels come down low enough. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize also is that the public outreach that was performed both by the department and the stakeholder groups was extraordinary. This was such a short window to alert the public to the dangers involved, it could have only have happened with an incredible effort on, on all of their parts. Again, the stakeholders were, were a big player in that. And I think it points out something that, that uh, is clear from this. There was no opposition to this closure because we all have the same interest at heart, which is the safety of the public. There was no opposition from the industry. There was support for this because they have as much a stake in, in public safety as, as, the, as the department and the, um, and the commission. And I think that uh, that speaks well to the, to the nature of the industry and their, and their concern for public safety. Um, I maybe have the luxury as, as a, more of a policymaker and, and not a scientist to, to speak a little more globally about uh, what's going on. We don't know whether it's specifically climate change, whether it's the blob, whether it's El Nino that's causing this, but the oceans are changing, and they're changing fast. Um, they're changing in all kinds of ways, particularly in the timing of seasonal events. Um, and we need to look at long-term adaptation. I really view this as a shot across the bow. I think this is going to be the kind of thing we see more and more, and we have to look at structures, as Chuck said, to make sure we can adapt quickly, that we have the methods in place for testing and, and protocols in place, um, and frankly, we're going to need new, new regulations and more funding correlating with that to be able to address the fact that we're dealing with um, reaction times that are shorter than we've ever had before, with problems that are um, either bigger or totally different than we've ever seen before. Um, and uh, that's going to be a real partnership, I think, between all the departments, the legislature, and the industries for not just this fishery, but for all the fisheries. Um, you know, one of the things we're working on at the department and the commission right now is a master's fishery plan, um, which again points out how fragmented fishery management is throughout the state. One of the things we can do is start to, under that process, pull it all together, um, but it's going to require um, clearly additional resources to bring new fisheries uh, into play under the ma master plan and to manage those fisheries over time. And the same goes for our uh, marine protected areas. We've done, a, I think, a masterful job of creating those um, protected areas in the, in the last handful of years. And those fisheries, uh, those protected areas are going to help fisheries, but only if we manage those marine protected areas well through the next stage, which is enforcement and management of them. Um, okay, so I will wrap up. Just a few final thoughts. Um, on the issue of uh, disaster relief, the Fishing Game Commission stands fully behind any effort and anything we can do to help in the request for disaster relief when and if that time comes, once we have the information. I would emphasize that a lot of that information is going to have to come from the industry itself. They're going to have to be a partner in determining exactly what losses are, but the Fishing Game Commission stands ready to help with that. Um, um, and in closing, I, I just would like to thank all of the folks at the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the volunteers, OUIHA, CDPH, who have all been working on the testing uh, and, and their collection, because that's, that's, it's, it's a collaborative effort. It's not uh, one group going out and doing this. It's dependent upon a, all of us uh, working to make sure the testing. Um, and of course, uh, the Commission stands by and monitoring this daily and weekly and are working with our partners to uh, solve this as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. You. We're really grateful. Mr. Sklar, thank you very much for all of your service uh, and uh, for your thorough report as well. We're appreciative uh, that you are here today. We're going to be having uh, one time for questions, if it works for the assembly member, uh, at the end of each panel. So again, Mr. Sklar, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next on our docket, we have Patrick Kennelly. He is chief of the food safety section, and Dave Mazera, who is chief of the food and drug branch of the California Department of Public Health. Uh, we're going to call them CDPH from here on out, and they ensure public health standards are met 
prior to any consumption of crab by the public. Each are going to have five minutes to be able to do their report, and we're going to start with Patrick. And again, both of you, thank you so much for being here today. If you don't mind, I'm going to just briefly start and give you guys a high-level overview of our department and programs that we have that collaborate. Um, again, my name is Dave Mazzara. I'm the chief of the Food and Drug Branch with the Department of Public Health. And thank you, uh, Senator McGuire and Assemblymember Wood. We appreciate ha having us here today. Uh, thank you also to our partners that we collaborate with in our agencies, and thank you to the industry because our partnership with you is critical in, in achieving what we're doing and getting things done. Um, one of the things I want to mention is that our role, our department has multiple programs that make this happen. We have a pre-harvest shellfish program in our environmental management branch that does the biotoxin monitoring program in the oceans year-round. So they're checking the oceans for um, harmful algal blooms to see what's coming our way, looking at trends, so that we, then we can get ahead of these kind of things and try to um, educate our, ourselves, our partners, and the public on what's coming our way. That's one, one of the programs. The second program is our food and drug laboratory branch. That's the labs that we have that do the testing and analysis of a lot of these samples that you guys are submitting um, and the data that's being reported. So that's a critical part of our, of our department as well, and that's the laboratory side of it. The third part of our program at our department that is, that's also critical is the food and drug branch, which I manage and run. Um, we do the post-harvest shellfish and seafood um, oversight. We're also the, the program that issues the advisories based on the advice we get from all three of those programs. So from the food and drug lab and from the environmental management branch. So together, all three of our programs constitute the Department of Public Health's pre-harvest to post-harvest shellfish um, oversight. One thing I also want to mention, too, is that um, we are very thankful for the things that you guys are doing with us, um, the work you're doing to, to keep this going. We rely critically on you to provide us both with information on what's happening out there, our partners to help us accomplish um, getting the samples analyzed and into our lab, and also working with us on collaborating on next steps. Without that, we could not get this done. So um, I'm going to turn over to Pat Kennelly, who's going to actually give you a lot more detail and more information on the things you want to hear about in terms of the latest data and, and information we have on this with our department. So, Pat, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Uh, members, Pat Kennelly, I manage the food safety program for the California Department of Public Health. I appreciate the opportunity to come here today and, and speak with you. Um, let's start by, by way of just giving a little bit of background. I think folks have become very well versed in uh, pseudonychia and demoic acid over the last uh, month or so. Uh, but just for those that, that may not be aware, um, demoic acid is a naturally occurring neurotoxin um, that's related to a bloom of a particular single cell algae uh, called pseudonychia. Um, the conditions that support its growth are, are somewhat unpredictable, but we can generally say that we do tend to see larger blooms of it during the warmer months of the year when the ocean waters are a little bit warmer. Shellfish and finfish are capable of accumulating levels of demoic acid uh, in their tissues and in their uh, intestinal tracts. Uh, they don't seem to apparently have a whole lot of ill effects from the consumption of it. However, when humans or other mammals consume them, uh, we can see uh, significant illness and even, even death associated with uh, the consumption of those contaminated products. The presence of pseudonychia and demoic acid is, is not new in California. Uh, we've monitored it for a number of years and levels have varied from year to year. Uh, I think has been indicated already this is the first year that we've really seen uh, the levels progress and continue at such an elevated level all the way up to the opening of Dungeness crab season uh, and actually impact the, the season. Mr. Kennedy, real quick, can you just pull your mic a little sure. closer? They just have a little uh, challenge here in the back. Sure. I'm just trying to keep it from echoing too much. All right. Thank you so much. Um, as Dr. Mazzara in, uh, indicated, you know, our monitoring starts with our marine biotoxin monitoring program in the environmental management branch. Uh, we've got volunteers that are collecting uh, water samples from 100 different sites across the, the California coastline. Uh, those are coming in. And when we start seeing elevated levels of pseudonychia starting to show up in analyses, that's an indication for the department to start initiating analysis of some of the species that we know are going to be impacted by that. So we usually start with our bivalve shellfish and getting down into the areas where we have small finfish and uh, uh, you know, crabs, we'll also be collecting those uh, samples as well so that we can get a good read on how those species are being impacted by the, uh, the algal blooms. Uh, this year, again, a very unique year for us. Uh, the event began in uh, late April, and we saw significant increases in pseudonychia at various sampling points from the Oregon border down through Santa Barbara County. Um, 
The bloom increased in intensity in different areas at different times, uh, and it's remained fairly abundant across the coastline through August of this year. Uh, I'm happy to report that the levels in the water have subsided, started subsiding in September, and by October in most of our monitoring locations uh, were very, very low or non-detectable. Um, typically, once the levels of Sudanichia decline, it does take a period of time for the organisms that have been feeding on it uh, to clear that domoic acid from their system. Uh, typically, we will see uh, small fin fish such as anchovies and sardines and uh, bivalves such as uh, mussels and, and clams and oysters clear it from their systems much more rapidly than we do crabs. Uh, so this, the, the more recent results we've actually been uh, getting for our uh, bivalve shellfish and uh, fin fish have actually showed non-detectable levels or very low levels below the action levels. So those species have already cleared it and for the most part and, and are uh, in, in pretty good position. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, one more time, I'm going to have you just hug that mic. <coughs> I do apologize. Uh, they're just having some hard times hearing you in the back. I know you're trying okay. to watch the echo, so thank you. We issued several advisories during the summer months, uh, as you're aware, uh, to warn recreationally, uh, recreational uh, harvesters about uh, mussels and clams and also commercial and recreational harvesting of anchovies, sardines and crabs in the Monterey, Santa Barbara and uh, Santa Cruz County areas because of, of very high levels of domoic acid we were finding in those species at those time. Uh, to give a little bit of context as to how much sampling this year we've done, you know, in a normal year, probably 450 to 500 samples. We're well over 900 samples to date this year. And uh, with the current issue going on with crab and the large numbers of samples we're still collecting, that's going to continue to grow. I think most people know that the action levels that we're utilizing uh, for uh, warnings uh, in crab are 30 parts per million in the, the intestinal tract or the viscera and 20 parts per million in the meat. The sampling and testing that our lab does uh, is really intended to mimic how a consumer would uh, prepare the products or really trying to get as close as we can to what their exposure is going to be. So the crabs are fully cooked and then uh, the meat and the viscera are separated and then tested individually. We are routinely screening viscera because we know that's where the higher concentrations are going to be. And when we do find elevate, highly elevated levels in the viscera, then we are going ahead and screening meat as well. This year's been a unique year because for some of the first times, I think we have found uh, levels in the meat that are above the action level. In fact, we had to go back and change our websites, uh, which actually indicated that it typically is not found in the meat because we are finding it in the meat and finding it above the action level in the meat in a number of these samples. Um, Typically, we can get the samples turned around within the laboratory within two to three days once they're received. Uh, sometimes there are some, some delays and challenges from the point in time that the uh, products are caught to get them to the lab, especially when they're caught in the four corners of the state and our lab is located in Richmond. Uh, but uh, once they are there, they're able to move them and turn them around pretty quickly. Uh, we've continued to uh, coordinate with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and we very much pre appreciate their support uh, because they have uh, been instrumental in assisting us uh, along with the industry in identifying and collecting additional samples. We're going to continue to coordinate with our partners, with OEHA and with uh, Fish and Wildlife until this uh, incident subsides. Uh, once we do see uh, two sets of samples, and we're defining a set of samples as six crabs uh, caught from a particular area, uh, where two sets collected one week apart are not above the action level, that's at the point of time when uh, we, in, in consultation with OEHA, will be talking with Department of Fish and Wildlife about modifying the advisory that's in place. Uh, I'd like to thank the industry for the, uh, the support, uh, especially in the recent weeks uh, in, in terms of going out and collecting samples for us. Uh, we know it's hard and we know it's a cost when you can't utilize what you're catching other than to provide it as, as samples for the, the department. Uh, cost of fuel and the time it takes you to go out uh, you know, is recognized and we very much appreciate it, but it's uh, definitely needed for us to be able to monitor the situation and be able to gauge when we can uh, make the recommendation that uh, the advisory no longer needs to be in place. We are continuing to post results on the, our webpage uh, and we'll do so at, at minimum on a weekly basis, but as soon as we get results in, we do usually have them up within several hours uh, and we will continue to do that. Uh, for those... One more minute, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I will just summarize and, and close up by saying that the recent tests that we've seen are um, showing promise that we're uh, improving in the situation. Uh, I will say that the, the southern areas for the most part uh, from Half Moon Bay South are showing more improvement than the north coast areas, but the north coast areas we are seeing some significant improvement as well. 
We have additional samples um, coming in this week from, that'll be, uh, analysis will be out in the next few days for Fort Bragg, Bodega Bay, Half Moon Bay, and Monterey. Uh, so we're optimistic to see what those levels are and uh, we'll, we'll continue to monitor. Uh, I will note, just to, to give a little bit of context as well, for those that may not be familiar with the levels that we're finding, we're finding any levels that range from non-detectable levels, uh, which is at about 2.5 parts per million, which is the limit of detection for the analysis, to up, what was up to about 240 parts per million. We did just pull a very hot sample uh, from the Channel Islands area that actually tested at 1,000 parts per million. That is the highest sample we've ever found in crab viscera in California. Um, so extremely hot spot uh, there, but the coastal areas of Santa Barbara, again, much improved. Uh, you know, for the, for the crabs we're sampling there. So we have seen that the Channel Islands have kind of a, e a unique ecosystem over the years and that what goes on around them is not necessarily what's going on along the rest of the coastline. Uh, so, but I did want to provide that caveat. As people are looking at the results, they're going to see that new number and it is a, a big shock. It was a shock for us when we saw the result. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to Weehaw, who I think will be able to really give you some context on the potential illness and the, the threat of exposure to demonic acid. <coughs> No, thank you so much, Mr. Kennelly, uh, and it is an honor to be able to introduce Melanie Marty. Uh, she's the Acting Deputy Director for Scientific Affairs for the Office of Environmental Health Hazard, uh, and they are responsible for evaluating health risks from environmental con uh, chemical contaminants. Uh, they develop and maintain environmental indicators such as standards for demolic acid, uh, and they also are the ones that are providing all the information and advisories on safe fishing in California. Melanie, we're really grateful that you're here today. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. So as you've heard, demoic acid is a neurotoxin. It's produced by marine uh, mi microscopic algae. And it interacts with your nerve cells and results in release of what we call neurotransmitter, a particular one called glutamate. And neurotransmitters are, you can think of them as chemical messengers. So they tell a nerve to fire. So when you ingest enough demoic acid, you have this abnormal and sustained nervous system stimulation. So the symptoms you see are the result of this neurotoxicity. At lower exposures, it might just be vomiting, nausea, and that sort of GI distress. But as the exposures increase, you can get into some very severe neurological um, symptoms that include seizures, coma, abnormal heart rhythms, um, and a, a lot of other very severe effects, including up to death. So at higher doses, the nerve cells actually just die. And so it affects a certain part of the brain called the hippocampus that's involved in memory and spatial orientation. So the symptoms that you see are related to inability to remember things that you just, that just happened to you. Um, and also disorientation where you are in your own, your own surroundings. So we, we know most of what we know in humans uh, based on an, uh, an incident in 1987 in eastern Canada. And in that case, the source was identified as cultured blue mussels from Prince Edward Island. The Canadian authorities studied the situation and they came to the conclusion there was about 150 people that had been impacted. Um, most of those people experienced the GI problems, uh, nausea, vomiting, very common symptom. Many complained, about a half of them, of severe headache, and that would be part of the neurotoxicity. Confusion. So, uh, about 20 people were hospitalized and treated in the ICU. They had uh, disorientation. They didn't know where they were, couldn't recognize their surroundings, um, memory loss, coma seizures, couldn't speak, couldn't breathe, had to be intubated. So these are very severe effects from high exposures. Um, after the acute poisoning, a lot of the folks who recovered had problems remembering things. So, and this was a persistent problem. So the, the chemical was long gone, but the problem persisted, and it persisted because they lost brain function. So the name of the shellfish poisoning is called amnesic shellfish poisoning, so it affects your memory. And then a few individuals also had persistent long-term weakness in their extremities, so it tells me that it affects other things besides your brain. It also affects the nerves in the rest of your body. Uh, it, there was indications that most of the people who got really sick, not only had they eaten a lot, but they also were older. So age is a sensitive factor for this. Um, 
the ones who were younger than 65 that got really sick, uh, most of them had kidney disease. And that's important because that's the way your body gets rid of whatever demoic acid gets into you. So it's actually poorly absorbed across your gut, but what does go in circulates throughout your body, can get in your brain, everywhere else, and your kidney is responsible for getting rid of it. So if you have kidney disease, you're not gonna be very good at clearing the chemical. So the, in, in that incident, the Canadian health authorities did go back, they got samples of the meals that these folks had had, um, at least one subset of them, and they were able to see how much demoic acid was in the muscles that the people had eaten. So they had an idea of the amount that it takes to get you pretty sick. So this was really the first recorded outbreak of human poisoning from demoic acid, um, which is interesting because it's not like it's brand spanking new, it's been around for a long time. Um, and there haven't really been officially confirmed cases of at least severe poisoning um, after that Canadian outbreak, but part of that is the, the Canadian outbreak resulted in setting standards and protocols for um, closing fisheries, so that those actions have certainly helped uh, avoid other acute poisoning episodes like the one that we saw in eastern Canada. So uh, from that incident, scientists got interested in studying the toxicity of demoic acid and a lot more animal studies uh, started happening. It's still, the database is still relatively small, um, but we do see the same things in animal models that we see in people. So um, it's pretty, we're pretty sure it, you know, it's, it's functioning the same way in animals. So this includes all the neurological symptoms. You see damage in the same part of the brain in rodent models and monkey models who have been exposed to demoic acid. Scientists have also done field studies looking at primarily the California sea lion, which is sort of a sentinel species for the presence of demoic acid. They experience the same things, confusion, disorientation, seizures, um, and brain damage. There are um, studies that looked at whether rodents given demoic acid could learn, because believe it or not, rats do learn. Um, there's some tests that have shown that demoic acid interferes with their ability to learn. So one thing I really wanted to uh, note was that there is concern for exposure of um, pregnant women and very, very young children to demoic acid based on the animal studies. So a number of researchers looked at developmental toxicity in rodent models. They found that the fetus and very, and very newborn animals are very sensitive to the neurotoxicity of demoic acid. So those studies had to be done by injecting animals. So it's a lot different than eating it because when you inject it, you don't have to absorb. It's put directly in. So we can't really relate very well those studies to the human situation um, where we're eating it and, and our gut blocks a lot of the absorption. Ms. Marty, we have about one minute. All right. Thank you so much. Sure. So the, um, the action levels came from figuring out how much it took to make the people in Canada sick and then how much muscle they had eaten and back calculated out, put in an uncertainty factor of 10 to 12 or so. Uh, to come up with 20 parts per million in the muscle, the muscle meat, mm -hmm. um, and uh, 30 parts per million in the viscera, because you don't eat nearly as much of the viscera as you do the muscle meat. And the U.S. has adopted this value. We use that value to make a determination whether there's public health risk. Um, and you've already heard from these folks how all of that works. Thank you. No, thank you so much, Ms. Marty. We're really grateful that you're here and for explaining uh, the potential impacts of eating shellfish uh, or crab uh, or what other uh, type of fishery may be impacted by demoic acid. So thank you so much. Uh, we are now going to turn it over uh, to uh, Kat Coleman. She's the Executive Director of the Ocean Protection Council. She's also Deputy Secretary for Oceans and Coastal uh, Policy for the California Natural Resources Agency. And Ms. Coleman is going to discuss ocean conditions. Uh, there are many theories that folks have been talking about throughout the state on why we're seeing these high levels, and she is also going to be addressing the issue of ocean temperatures as well. Ms. Coleman, uh, it's great to have you back uh, in Sonoma County. Thank you so much, Senator McGuire, and thank you also, Assemblyman Wood, as well as uh, your inimitable staff, staffer, Mr. Westlow. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be in Sonoma County. Um, 
and I want to thank you for the opportunity of having a moment to talk about changing ocean conditions. And if there, um, there are basically two messages I want you to take home. Um, one is we've had absolutely crazy weather. The ocean conditions have been absolutely crazy. And our scientists are telling us that these conditions are likely to be the new normal. So because of that, we, are need, we need to make new investments in how we can both work together as both uh, Mr. S Commissioner Sklar and um, Mr. Bonham were talking about. We need to make new investments in how we work together as well as in the science so we can be more nimble in how we respond when these kinds of crazy situations like we're facing right now um, visit us around the holidays. I was talking to my butcher on Sunday, and they do a huge business in crab, and they were already remarking about how much it was hurting this small uh, market's bottom line for the year. And so it's to remind ourselves that you all are impacted, we're impacted because we can't have it on our table, but there's a whole supply chain that is impacted as well. So in in brief, the Ocean Protection Council was created in 2004 in order to coordinate the activities of ocean-related uh, issues and policy and to work with colleagues on the important issues facing the ocean of the day. And so I've been really thrilled to watch to see how well these organizations within the state, it's a big and complicated state as you well know, and how well they have been and effectively they've been re responding to this crisis. Um, today, I just want to give you a broad overview of what we're seeing on changing ocean conditions. And I am dyslexic, so this is going to always be a challenge for me to make this work. Hmm. Forward doesn't forward. Is there a science? There, there. there it is. Yay! We already did that. Okay. Do you mind just, uh, do you mind just hitting them down there? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. Thank you. I've been saved. Um, so, ocean health is a global issue that will require global solutions, but as we know, the imp and as we can see, the impacts are pl playing out both at a local and a regional scale. And this slide doesn't come across too well in this particular uh, venue, but the big blob that you see up there is, is the huge mass of warm water at the top of the picture in the Pacific Ocean that is causing the problems off the West Coast. And it's the so-called blob for being, that's being blamed for the toxic algae blooms, and which have also caused marine mammal deaths and obviously the crab fishery closer. And also down at the bottom here are a series of species that are showing up on California beaches and in the water that uh, haven't been seen before. Just uh, a recognition that it is, uh, it's a series, the, the ecosystem is shifting in response to the changes in the climate. Next slide. Okay. Um, well, we'll just skip over that one. Just it's changing and we have valuable ecosystems at risk. So what I, this then is in, 2015, 2014, 2015 in particular, the ridiculously resilient ridge of high pressure formed over the west coast and for the past couple of years has diverted the storm systems north and I'm sure you have all noticed that as you've been out on the water and it has extended our drought. The ridge has also caused the blob to form at this warm water blob off our coast. And the thought is that if El Nino shows up in force as predicted, the blob will likely dissipate and create cooler weather than we have seen in the past couple of years, and which have been extremely hot and dry. And although El Nino should disrupt the blob, we typically get better and more, excuse me, bigger and more toxic blooms around El Nino. And we certainly will have more runoff, which also triggers more algal growth. So it's highly likely that we will have more of these algal blooms under any scenario. And that's the bad news. The latest forecast, next slide. The late, I just wanted to show this because, and again, it doesn't show up because the light's bright here, but you can see those large red areas. And the difference between 1997, which was the last really big El Nino year, and warm water temperatures, and this year, how much larger that area of warm water is. So that's just how much bigger the event is. <clears throat> so next slide. So 
2015 was unprecedented. The algal blooms we're seeing off the coast are similarly unprecedented in their size, duration, and toxicity. Warming and ocean temperatures have led to the blob, which in, in turn create the toxic algal blooms, which impact all of our marine resources. And many of our top fisheries, and for California, like spiny lobster, dungeness crab, ground fish, anchovy, sardine, mackerel, are all affected by domoic acid. So I just wanted to share, you know, the, the, what, well, what can we do? Um, one of the investments that the Ocean Protection Council made was in a model that, that uh, with, we invested and the team at Santa Cruz University, Dr. Kudela, put together a real-time model which allows us to know, to, to forecast what domoic acid levels will be out in the ocean. This has then in turn helped the Department of Public Health know when and where to go test. And so we've been verif verifying that model and it's really a good model and allows us to then use both satellite data and imagery in order to predict where we are going to see domoic acid events and where then to target our uh, our monitoring efforts. And that's the kind of science to resource management projects that are very helpful in b making better decisions and using our very limited resources more intelligently to get the best information available uh, to decision makers. And I guess um, I would close by suggesting that uh, as Director Bonham and Commissioner Sklar noted, we need to work together to bring together the fishermen with the scientists to the resource manager. And we're going to need to, I think, convene and talk and identify what are the most important science issues, what are the most important policy and regulatory issues. And using this almost as you will as a, you know, you become the canaries in the coal mine or I wish I had a good ocean metaphor for that. Um, to how do we do, how do we respond nimbly to the crazy weather, to crazy changing ocean conditions, because we often, we're not gonna know what, what we're gonna be facing. Our life has been kind of a nice, kind of little back and forth in the ocean for temperatures, and all of a sudden we're seeing these really large fluctuations, and we're gonna need to respond to those in a really quick and smart way. So I think the challenge is to come together, pool our resources, and um, do things a little bit differently, smarter, cheaper, faster. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Coleman, and we're grateful for our entire panel uh, for all of your prep, uh, all of your work uh, coming into today's hearing, and of course, out in the field as well. What we'd like to be able to do is open it up for questions. We're gonna start with the Vice Chair, know that he has some questions, and I'll be following up. Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much for all your all your uh, comments here, and I, I do have some questions. And first of all, I want to just address something, and I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. Obviously, Senator McGuire and I will talk about this, but but I look forward to the opportunity to work with uh, Director Bonham, uh, Fish and Game Commission, and how we can streamline this process going forward and looking for additional resources. Obviously, it's a critical critical issue, especially considering the changing climates in which we are experiencing. So uh, a couple of questions for you. Uh, the domoic acid levels, obviously, they're unprecedented at this, at this time. Did we see these toxins levels rise during previous El Ninos? Obviously, not to this level, but is this something that follows the El Nino phenomenon? My understanding is, yes, we do see a rise related to El Ninos, because at warmer water, okay. you get more, so whether it's an El Nino or any event that would raise water temperatures. The addition to uh, the Assistant Secretary's answer that I'd offer is, my expectation is that our department, in collaboration with those here, will use this unfortunate situation to identify targeted research needs. Recall my earlier comment about the difference between causation and correlation. Right. We may see correlation between algal blooms and certain weather events. What we've got to go forward doing is teasing out causation. Uh, our department will never have the full capacity to do all research needs, hence the partnership you see up here, and we need to go to our UC systems, our CSU systems, come out of this event with targeted research so we're better prepared uh, in front of the next scenario. Okay, great. Um, obviously, this is not a California phenomenon. We're looking at Oregon and Washington fisheries affected as well. Um, are we seeing trends based on their testing? And, and how might that, if, if we are seeing trends as far as these acid levels coming down, 
How, how does that bode for us in California? Uh, the most recent uh, levels that I've seen from, from the state of Washington and Oregon are also showing improving trends, uh, reducing uh, the levels of domoic acid in the, the organisms that they're testing. So I think it somewhat mirrors what we are starting to see here in California. By function of the Tri-State Commission <coughs> Committee that I mentioned a minute ago, uh, our department is actively engaged with our counterparts in both states. Uh, I expect next Monday and Tuesday we'll be on the phone with them looking at their most recent data. They have closed. Their data looks to be trending better, faster. It's colder up there. And they too have had unprecedented experiences. They each decided to delay their December 1 openers. And in an unparalleled kind of experience, Washington closed through the summer in some of their per very popular crab fisheries. Couple more quick ones, and I apologize. Is that okay? No, sure. Please. Okay. Um, unusual that you mentioned um, uh, that acid levels are now showing up in the meat. How uh, do we have experience on how long that's going to take to clear, and what is, what effect might that have on our ability to open the season? Yeah, we don't we don't have a lot of data on this. As I as I mentioned earlier, this is really the first year that we found uh, levels in the meat above the action level. Uh, what we do typically see, the correlation we see, is that the higher the acid level in the viscera, the higher the level in the meat. As we're starting to see these levels come down, we are going to try to monitor uh, so we get we can at least get some sense as to what we can expect in the in the future in terms of that. But we would expect them to probably leach out of the meat at the same rate uh, that we're going to see the levels come down in the viscera at this point. The levels are not necessarily proportional. Um, so in other words, you can have two crabs that have 100 parts per million in the viscera. One might have 10 parts per million in the meat. The other one might have 24. So it, there's not a direct correlation, so it's very difficult to, to come up and, and, and give an easy, easy answer. But uh, I, I think we're optimistic that the levels in the meat are nowhere near as high as they are in the viscera. They are over the action level, but they don't exceed the action level by anywhere near the percentage that we are seeing it in the viscera. So hopefully we'll see that resolve uh, as rapidly as we see the viscera resolve so that won't be an issue. Great. And a question for our science people from OEHA, um, and that is, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the toxin and the effects on the, on the human body and animals is, is, is pretty disturbing at, at certain levels. So this 30 part per million standard is a national standard, as, as, as I understand now? Yes. And, and so at, at what levels do we start to see some of these other symptoms? Obviously, not, it's not 31 parts per million. So where do we start to see the vomiting, diarrhea, and, or, and, and in, obviously these are generalities, so I'm not trying to pin you down, but I'm just trying to understand the scope of the, the challenge we're facing. Well, the, the information that came from the Canadian incident is really the best information we have in terms of what levels caused in, disease in people. And it seems that about 300 parts per million people started being pretty sick. Um, but of course, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty in that number because people had to recall how much they had eaten um, and they didn't have the, the muscles to test right away, so we're not sure whether the test results were that accurate. Sure. Okay, great. And one, one final question. Um, are there other factors? Um, are there other factors we are looking at that might be contributing to the bloom? Say, you know, runoff from 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 the land, some products on the land. Is there anything else that we're looking at? I, I can say, generally speaking, not related to this incident, that our department works with many agencies along the coast, tracking and better understanding the relationship between land-based activities, estuary health, and nearshore water quality. And I think generally, if you take a look at that data set, you'll see causation between practices, hydrologic events, and l lessening water quality offshore. Um, I'm not aware that we've turned to whether that's potentially an element involved in this large-scale bloom. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, thank you so much, Mr. Vice Chair, and greatly appreciate you being here today again. Thank you. I uh, have a few questions. I'm going to start with Ms. Coleman in regards to the cause. Um, you know that we have a significant El Nino event that is off our coast with those warm waters. Um, you also talked about a potential for a new normal, I'm paraphrasing here, that we need to be able to prepare for in the state. So uh, we have this significant El Nino event plus potential for 
this incident to be exasperated by climate change. Correct? All right. And and I'm not sure that we can answer this yet. I do know that uh, scientists are looking at this. Is uh, we saw quite the, the temperatures off the California coast last year, particularly in the north coast, were quite warm. In fact, I think it's the first time decades that we actually had a commercial squid harvest off of Del Norte and Humboldt County uh, that measured significantly for uh, those fishermen. But we didn't have any algae blooms last year. Any discussion or is that an item that, uh, that you've been having or an item that you need to be able to bring back to have future discussion on why this year versus last year when we actually saw some potential of higher water temperatures? Um, I, there was a bloom last year, but not nearly as at this level. Um, and I think that's very much one of the areas where we need to do some more investment so that we can understand correlation yeah. um, and correlate these things uh, so that we can better predict and understand what's coming at us. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Bonham, um, you had mentioned the, the coordination between uh, commercial and recreational. And if we could just be candid, and I think that everyone is concerned about that, if one goes earlier than the other, mm -hmm. uh, and there uh, are high acid levels in a crab, that can impact the entire industry. So that's why you're wanting to be able to bring commercial and recreational together to be able to make that joint decision, correct? Yes, but also because each community is an important constituent of ours and yours. We need each other in the long run. Mm -hmm. We wrote into our department emergency regulation the requirement that we're going to give everybody notice so that those of you who are not able to turn on a dime and be ready to go will have space to prepare for that. And we also wrote into our emergency regulation the prompt for me as director to turn to the commissioner and the commission. And when we have the data and we have the recommendation, we're going to try to harmonize and equalize, figure out a way, see if we can meet everybody's interest. But at the end of the day, public health and safety will drive. Absolutely. Mr. Sklar, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I would just add in terms of things we can do in the future, one of the things that may make a dealing with these kind of issues easier as if in these very specific emergency situations we can give the director authority to both start a closure and end it. Um, there, there's, you know, the, the, the Meeting Procedures and, and Administrative Procedures Act put some, some burdens on us in that process since that's something we ought to look at. Thank you so much. Did you have a follow up, Mr. Bonham? Look, I, I understand the interest of both of those communities. Um, and anecdotally, I spent a ton of time in the ocean I can attest in my own experience, it's not scientific, it's been warmer. Uh, I haven't been wearing booties in my wetsuit. Uh, I know that the recreational folks worry about equity um, when they're having to be in the water around the same time as the commercial, and I understand the interest on the commercial front about livelihood. We're gonna have to sort that out. I predict now through the end of December is gonna be nuts for you, us, and all of us sitting here on going through this together. Thank you so much. And I think that's the important piece, right? Mm -hmm. We're all in this together and making sure that we continue that collaboration as we move forward. So thank you. Um, would like to go to Mr. Kennelly on talking about the hot spots. So you had mentioned the Channel Islands and um, seeing that unprecedented spike. Um, and then we also saw, I think, last week in tests off of Fort Bragg, 66% of samples uh, were coming in hot as well some theory behind that on why one week we could potentially see uh, a lower amount of the samples not coming in hot and then a week or two later you see significant number of sample coming in hot can you talk about the theory behind that sure I, for i'll cover fort bragg first fort bragg was was a unique situation uh the the, le the results we initially had uh immediately before the the suspension and the delay in the, of these the seasons uh, were, were collected really close to the coast, and so we really didn't have elevated levels, so it didn't appear that the levels of Sudanichia okay. there had ad ad adversely affected those organisms. The more recent tests we got were a little bit further out, 
Uh, so it's a little bit different area, and uh, those are, are certainly more impacted, and they're more characteristic of what we're seeing from the samples that we've been getting from Crescent City, Humboldt, Trinidad, uh, you know, and down the coast. So we were a little shocked that we had that, that very, very low level in Fort Bragg in between mm -hmm. levels of, of very high levels. So this really kind of explained it. it just happened to be an anomaly. It's, it. again, a little microcosm, a little area that has its own little unique e ecosystem that was apparently not as impacted. Um, by the algal blooms, so as a result, the organisms that were, you know, for, for the most part, I guess, living in that area did not seem to have the impacts. And I will say with the, the, the thousand part per million level that we found in or, and around the Channel Islands, uh, you know, we've seen over the, the years, the Channel Islands have, have been a little bit of a challenge for us in terms of hot spots. But we can have the rest of the coastal areas not have any issues with elevated levels in organisms anymore. We will still continue to see some hot spots around the Channel Islands. So, again, probably some research that needs to be done there to really understand why. But I, th I think our, uh, you know, anecdotally we would attribute it to, you know, they, be, they each have some, probably some unique ecosystems. And, and you can see that in looking at the results where the north side of an island and the south side of the island are, are dramatically different. And these are not, you know, these are not huge islands, uh, you know, that are out there. So uh, probably more research to really definitively tie it down. But that's our best guess. I appreciate that. Director Bonham? Yes, more next step. Commissioner Scalar is right. I think there's administrative improvement we can find for rapidity and action on our side. I've also, for what it's worth, spoken to my director counterparts at DPH and OEA. As we get on the back side of this situation, I intend to ask our technical staff to come together and do kind of a lessons learned hot wash and see if we can design the next better iteration of our protocols based on what we've just gone through. That will require, I believe, capacity, and I hope we have an opportunity to come talk to you all about that. And I know this is a concern of a SIM member would as well, so talk about that. Is that going to be an ask on behalf of the budget? Uh, are you going to need to be able to look at maybe too early to be able to answer this uh, and not try to put you on the spot so good times? Uh, but also looking at some potential legislation. What, what are some of your thoughts on that administrative or legislative fix on that? On an administrative front, I think the department and commission can continue to fine tune their, tune their rulemaking. Mm -hmm. On a legislative front, it is challenging to have management of a fishery stock divided between three different entities, the legislature, the department, and the commission. I think there's room for improvement there without undercutting the legislature's long-running uh, involvement in this fishery. <clears throat> I also think there's a way to give, with boundaries, delegated authority to an entity or a position like mine to make decisions in a tight time frame. Finally, I'm going to demur on your question about budget, but say that I think to do monitoring like we're going to need in the future requires resources. And leave it at that. That's a good, safe answer. I like that. Um, the other item I wanted to address is the issue of ensuring that there's consumer confidence. So when we open up uh, the fishery, uh, making sure that consumers know that not only is it fresh, but safety. I think that's the whole other discussion that we need to be able to have, both as a legislature uh, on the department level, the commission, uh, as well as the industry, of making sure that Californians and those across the nation that love California Dungeness and Rock Crab can eat it safely. Um, and I, I think we need to continue to focus internally on assisting with efficiencies, making sure that we have uh, the most up-to-date testing systems, and then each department is working together. And externally, we need to make sure that we are collaborating on message to the consumer. Because uh, I think that is going to uh, be beneficial long-term if we see this delay persist. I'd like to be able to end my questions on um, making sure that we all leave here with the understanding, and this is to you, Mr. Director, about the process for financial assistance. And you had said uh, it was great that we had the letter from the congressional delegation. I do want to say thank you uh, on behalf of the assembly member and myself to Congressman Huffman for taking the lead on that. Can you walk us through those steps? And I just want to sure. talk about a potential worst case scenario. I would always hope for the best, but look at planning on what those steps will need to be relating to financial assistance for the industry, uh, both on the state level as well as on the federal level. Yes. Um, 
So first, it is a federal process uh, controlled through the United States Department of the Commerce. Uh, it's uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration's National Marine Fisheries Service. Try that for a mouthful. We in the community know it as NIMFS, as you do as well, which actually has an office here in Santa Rosa. There are two different federal statutes, as I mentioned. They're very similar, but with some subtle distinctions. The takeaway from both is, generally speaking, it's a petition, if you will, my word, process, where historically a governor of an affected state makes a petitioned request to the Secretary of Commerce. We have recent experience doing that in California, as I mentioned, in 08, 09, salmon, late 90s, groundfish. It's also the case in those federal statutes that the secretary uh, herself can make a sua sponte decision and decide to declare a disaster. You have three basic components no matter which statute you're operating under. You've got to establish a disaster. It's primarily about economics, but at least one of the two statutes allows for consideration of kind of sociological impact. It's data-driven. This follows what happens, as you know well, with the federal emergency arm, which you've led uh, incredibly through a difficult situation in the recent fires. So you're asking from a state to the feds, here's our case, declare. Um, upon declaration, you still need Congress to make an appropriation, so you need funds. You're proving disaster. You're ensuring that the impact is an allowable cause, so you're looking at uh, your losses um, through the chain often, and uh, you have to show this fishery failure. So our department has already begun to pull numbers because we know how you build the predicate for this, so we can go backwards and look at three-year average landings. I'll just give you a for instance. If you look backwards over three years in November, you can easily see, we have the data set, the District 10 for Dungeness Crab in November might typically bring in about $18 million. Or if you take a look at three-year average landings on rock crab, you look at November, maybe it's about 200,000. So I think we're well served to kind of sort through that database, start compiling it. Hopefully we never have to use it. Absolutely. Uh, but if we do, we'll be best prepared. Uh, and I would expect if we pull that trigger, sadly, I, I feel we'll have a upwelling of unanimity and we'll go forward and try to accomplish both a designation of fund and then the redistribution. Our department in late 08, 09, along with other entities, basically became a clearinghouse to move the money back out as people establish damages, and that's generally how this structure might work. No, I appreciate that, Mr. Director, and I, I know this is an item that you've been working. Um, I did not want to leave this panel uh, to make sure that we had it completely spelled out, and I think our bottom line is, your bottom line is, we want to get crabbers back out in the water and back to work. And we want to make sure the public's health is priority number one. Uh, and I really appreciate the planning uh, that has been going on in case we have to look at that worst case scenario, which none of us want to go towards. But I appreciate the planning that's been going into that. Uh, would like to be able to see a similar member before we move on to our second panel if there are any other questions that you may have. Is there any follow up from a panel that uh, you would like to be able to add prior to us advancing to our second? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for all of your time. Really appreciate that. We're going to be uh, having a quick transition. Um, that was uh, our panel based off of all state agencies. And on behalf of Assemblymember Wood, want to say thank you to all of those uh, agency heads and representatives who have been working so hard uh, on this issue. We are now going to be having a briefing from the California fishing industry and representatives on the impacts of fisheries. We have uh, several individuals that are here today. We're going to call up our first four to kick us off. 
We have Valerie uh, Germini, who is the Fisheries uh, Policy Advisor for the Ocean Protection Council. We're going to hear from Don Marshall, board member of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association. Jerry Hemmingston, supervisor, Del Norte County, also commercial representative to the Dungeness Crab Task Force. And then we're going to round it out with Rick Gutierrez, rock crab fishery from the Santa Barbara Seafood Station. We'll then bring up the remaining three for our second panel. Uh, as we are transitioning, there are a few thank yous. I'd like to be able to say thank you to Tom Westlow, who is the chief consultant uh, for this joint committee. Tom, thank you so much for all of your work. We are so grateful. And to the team uh, within our office and the assembly member's office for all of the work that has gone into the organization. Thank you. Any thank yous that you'd like to be able to add, assembly member? You got it covered, Mr. Senator. All right. Thank you so much. And we are still looking for Rick Gutierrez. If Mr. Gutierrez can make their way, his way up to the front, Mr. Gutierrez. He is, we're not, all right, hey, there we go. So what we're gonna do, if any of them can catch him as he walks back in, tell him to hoof it up uh, to the front. Uh, we're gonna start though uh, our first panel uh, with Valerie Termini. Uh, she is the Fisheries Policy Advisor for the Ocean Protection Council. Thank you for all of your work. We are thrilled that you are here, are here today, and we're going to have you kick off with an eight-minute presentation. And again, thank you for all of your efforts. Thank you. I'll try to be quicker as well. Uh, so uh, my name is Valerie Termini. And I'm going to have you hug that mic as well. I'm sorry. If you, everyone can just pull the <laughs> mic really close, I do apologize. It's just hard to hear in the back. Thank you. So I'm here today to highlight the California Dungeness Crab Task Force recommendations regarding the demoic acid situation, as well as to provide a brief overview of the task force legislative report that will be given in February. For clarification, the OPC supports the task force administration and has funded the task force since the development of the trap limit program in 2008. The task force is charged with discussing and making recommendations to the California State Legislature, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and to the Commission on a wide range of issues, notably those related to fisheries management, commercial and recreational, including the design, implementation, and evaluation of the trap limit program. And additionally, the task force provides guidance to other agencies, most notably in a public health situation. The task force is composed of 27 members who represent a diverse range of interests and priorities. Since 2008, the task force has reached general agreement on a number of management issues and provided four reports to the legislature, department, and the commission to help inform management of the crab fishery. The most notable of these recommendations was to establish the trap limit program. The task force worked cooperatively with the department to develop the program, which was first implemented in the 2013-2014 season. Since the implementation of the trap limit program, the task force has provided a number of recommendations to adaptively manage the program and the final report from the task force is due in 2017, which will provide additional recommendations, including an initial evaluation of the trap limit program. Since 2015, the task force has proactively engaged in supported discussions with the state and federal agencies and conservation organizations to also help reduce the risk of whale entanglements and dangerous crab and fishing gear. The task force looks forward to continuing the support to support the industry's efforts to address this issue including testing short-term strategies during the 2015-2016 season. In October 2015, the task force approved a recommendation for an industry-funded lost gear retrieval program. Although more complex, quite simply, the program would require fishermen to voluntarily retrieve tra traps at the close of the commercial season and hand them over to the department, who would then impound the gear and potentially issue violations. The program would be supported by impound fees and paid by fishermen and would require strong coordination between law enforcement and those fishermen retrieving the gear. A report will be submitted to the Joint Committee on Fisheries and Aquaculture in early 2016 with a request for legislative action. The task force will also continue working with the department to evaluate and fine tune the trap limit program and the lost gear fishery recovery program. The OPC's funding of the task force also expires in early 2017. The task force may also make a request to the legislature in 2016 to report on or appropriate some of the 1.4 million surplus funds from the trap limit program. In the short term, the task force would like to work with the legislature to explore options to keep the task force operating until a funding strategy is in place. 
The task force will also continue reflecting on the work of the task force and potentially recommend updates or adjustments to the composition and funding of the task force in upcoming reports. Obviously, why we're all here today, the demoic acid situation has been a priority topic for the task force and of great concern to the entire fleet. Many task force members have been actively involved in collecting crabs for the tests and are assisting the Department of Public Health in coordinating on those tests. Following the department's announcement of a delay in the commercial fishing season, the executive committee of the task force provided to the Department of Public Health, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, the Fish and Game Commission, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife guidance on testing protocols and considerations for opening the season. It's important to note here the executive committee of the Dungeness Crab Task Force is comprised of commercial fishermen and a processor. There is not a recreational representative on the uh, executive committee. And so in those recommendations, they listed several, most notably uh, to reduce cost and avoid lab buildup. They did a two-week testing protocol. So if the tests, if the uh, measurements were above 60 parts per million, they could test every week. Ports could also be clustered to reduce the number of samples. The executive committee also suggested a statewide commercial opener that may be revisited should one area continue to retain high levels of demoic acid. And the executive committee also suggested a statewide recreational opener one week before the commercial fishery, recognizing that the Fish and Game Commission could open the fishery on a county by county basis when the Department of Public Health and OEHA issue a letter declaring that the specific area is safe. Mr. Chairman, you have one minute. I'd like to know from the state's perspective, it's been incredibly helpful to have the cooperation of the task force mem mem members throughout the delay and the support of them uh, to help provide samples and then along with any insights they've been providing all of us to help think through this delay and how we can work through and provide samples better and cheaper and faster. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much and thank you for being here. We're going to hold questions until the four have been able to uh, speak. Uh, we now have Don Marshall, uh, who is the president of the Small Boat Trollers Association. Uh, today he's going to be speaking to us as a board member of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association. Uh, he knows firsthand how much overhead a fisherman has, particularly uh, when it comes to the operation and maintenance of the boat and talking about the impacts of the closed crab fishery. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Marshall. You have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'd like to take the time to say thank you for allowing me to attend and speak today to the panel as well. Um, I'm a crabber, troller, I fish for a living. The economic, economic impact at this point to the fleet overall is, uh, is severe and will continue to be as long as there is a closure. I think that I agree and uh, the fleet agrees as a whole uh, with many that we've heard here today that public safety is the main concern, not just for recreational entities but also for commercial entities. They are intertwined despite the fact that we don't agree on all issues. The end result is that we need to catch crab for different reasons. The only way to keep the public safe from getting sick from demoic acid that is in these crabs is to create a statewide opener that is uniform. It's obvious by the irregularities in the testing that's been given here by uh, California Department of Public Health. Crabs don't abide by district lines or county lines. They are highly migratory, seen by the anom anomalies and irregularities from week to week testing and they are highly unpredictable. Um, I advise for future of the fishery to approach this matter with extreme caution. We are in uncharted waters at this point in an issue that we have not seen in, um, in a long time. And as you've seen before, the panel uh, suggested that there's been only one real incident in Canada that where we were able to actually retain a good amount of research to support any theories in this issue. Um, the state of Oregon and Washington have set a public safety standard by safeguarding the public with closures statewide despite large areas where crabs were tested clean for demoic acid due to these hot spots in small areas where uh, the ecosystem is slightly different than other areas in those states. Oregon and Washington understand that by doing this they will not only toe the line for public safety but they will preserve what's left of a robust and resilient fishery that we've all worked hard to build. Um, and this would be for future marketing when the time is right and the crabs are safe to consume. In California, 
crab fishermen agree that we should follow suit for the same reasoning. Um, I am an avid sport fisherman, and for the record, I'd like to say that I want to see sport fishermen get their sport caught crab. They, as well as commercial fishermen, buy boats, they buy gasoline, diesel, they stimulate the economy down the line. Um, and I think that ultimately for the safety of the public and for their safety of their fishery as well as ours, um, it would be a blind approach to open a recreational fishery before the commercial fishery if the levels of demoic acid are still too high above the threshold. It's important to remember that we all want to catch crab. However, recreational fishermen are not doing it for a living. They're doing it for recreational purposes. Again, we all want it the same thing and we should work together to get what it is that we want, which is a safe opener for everybody and to be able to produce a solid product that's safe for the consumers to eat. Um, on another level, I'd like to say that I speak for all crabbers and fishermen that fish for a living when I say that we don't look for a handout or relief in any way. Should it come to that, it'd be nice to that we have laid the track work and foundation for such a situation should we have to experience something like that. Uh, but we want to do what we do best, which is go fishing. We want to produce a quality product, which is, which is what we've done in the past, and that's what we want to do in the future. Um, possible suggestions for things right now to change would be unemployment options for owners, operators, and crew members who are unable to earn due to the closure. In the past, when there's been mitigation from salmon closures, there's also been SBA loans offered uh, at low interest rates to owners uh, with good landing history and solid business plans uh, to not only bridge the gap in these trying times, but also to be able to re-gear for other fisheries. Again, we don't want the handout, we'd like to work. Um, on a personal note, I fish year round. I engage any fishery that I can that thinks, that I believe has uh, enough, enough fish or enough crab in it to be able to sustain an actual business. Uh, right now, I'm currently working at a friend's Christmas tree lot while I wait to see how my financial future unfolds. For now, I am able to earn some income but it's not enough to support my family and the immense infrastructure cost of the business simultaneously. Um, this is going to be the same across the board for people that have family or people that don't have family. The reality of it is, is that to be in this business from a commercial aspect requires an immense amount of money. And uh, all of us have spent that money before this season started getting ready for this season. Without bringing that money back, we can't only not bring back the infrastructure costs, but an income as well. Um, we have one minute, Mr. Marshall. Thank you. Um, if nature forces me or others out of the business, then so be it. Until then, we will fight the good fight, the right fight for public safety and the hope that we will be able to fish soon enough when it's the right time. Thank you. Mr. Marshall, thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Marshall, absolutely, let's give him a round of applause, please. Mr. Marshall is representing an industry that is in distress, may potentially need assistance when the darkest days are still ahead. And I just want to say on behalf of Sim Riverwood, we are grateful for you, uh, for you coming here today. And I got to say, it is rare for an industry to come together, even when it is against your financial self-interest, to focus on something greater as well. And just want to say thank you on behalf of this committee because it's incredible and greatly appreciate your sacrifice. And as uh, the director said, we are so sorry. Uh, and uh, know that we're going to continue, though, uh, to fight together. Uh, we're honored that Supervisor Hemmingston is here. Uh, he receives the award of the longest drive today. Uh, he drove from Del Norte County. Um, he's the commercial representative on the Dungeness Crab Task Force. 
Uh, the supervisor will be representing the commercial interests. Actually, I think we have, uh, I apologize, Ms. Gutierrez uh, is from Santa Barbara, so never mind. Uh, supervisor, <laughs> you're in trouble. Hey, sure. That's right, exactly. Uh, supervisor Hemison will be representing the commercial interests on the task force and present information on how they would like to see testing and seizing opening to potentially proceed. Supervisor, we're grateful that you're here and welcome. You have five minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak, uh, Senator McGuire and Assemblymember Wood, uh, as well as uh, thank you for all your help, uh, Mr. Westlaw. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, I came into this with a, a little different thinking. I'm a rule follower, so I put my presentation together. And I don't have much staff, so I'm it. And if there's any mistakes, it's all mine. Hey, there we go. It's all good. Um, I, am res uh, I am representing uh, the people in my district uh, who uh, uh, are fishermen as well as uh, uh, the northern uh, management uh, districts uh, uh, a lot of the ports uh, I can't say that I spoke to everybody but I think we're all on the same page uh, I am not representing the uh, supervisors as a whole we have not taken up this issue yet so I want to make that clear um, and we can go to the next slide I've seen enough of me uh, these are the four topics that I'd like to just discuss for a few minutes, the preseason testing, the season delay protocol, season opening, and the sports season opening protocols. So we can go to the next, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, of course, uh, as everybody has spoken to before, we, uh, we all think that uh, the, health and the public health and safety is priority number one, and we want to continue with that. Um, that keeps our market strong and the public confidence strong. So we, wanna, we, we do want to... Uh, keep that uh, foremost in our, uh, in our thinking and, and the industry feels that way. Uh, and because of the conditions this year, um, we uh, certainly collaborated and uh, wanted the department to test early and they saw the same indications uh, and tested early and we we're very fortunate that that, that came about uh, and allowing us to be proactive in what we're doing right now. Uh, we were very close to uh, I think we we're very close to opening the sports season. Uh, you know, we just barely made that deadline. They could have been out uh, and harvesting uh, contaminated crabs. So we're very fortunate, I think, that we kept in front of that. Uh, we'd like to see the early con uh, testing continue uh, in the future when conditions indicate. We don't want to make this so onerous that every year we have to test at a certain time. And uh, as Valerie was speaking to earlier, we, the Dungeness Crab Task Force made some recommendations um, to uh, kind of limit the testing. And if the test tested high, that they would, uh, we would limit the testing so that we didn't have all these tests going on. Uh, that they would have to test a whole bunch until we got to levels that seemed to be manageable and then maybe coming down uh, we could uh, we could start testing a little wider uh, the the Fort Bragg the unusual results in the and, and this has been already talked about in, in Fort Bragg where they had uh, a clear test and then all of a sudden through the roof uh, there, there probably needs to be some guidelines that we'd like to see what the department uh, would like us to do uh, as far as where we're, where we're testing. Uh, we do this on a voluntary basis. We go out and retrieve the, the crab on a voluntary basis. The, the f crab fishermen uh, do that on their own at their own expense. And uh, we're very, very happy that they do that. And we're very happy that the, the, the lab is making an effort to, to try to do these tests as quickly as possible. Uh, some of the results are coming back extremely slow, um, which is not an impact right now. But as we get closer to these uh, levels coming down, we're going to want to see an expedited process in that. And if that means we need more personnel or we need more labs, uh, then I think we need to do that. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, um, as far as the d delay, um, it's pretty pretty simple. Uh, we think that the rules are pretty much already out there. We do quality testing. We think basically the same protocol should be used when we do this. We think this should should be uh, a quality issue and that we should use those uh, same guidelines um, as uh, as quality testing. Uh, the dates, you know, maybe have to be a little bit different because of the dates that they do the testing on. But as far as the <coughs> The way that we go through that, um, I, I think, should be just like the quality testing. So we can go to the next slide. 
uh, this is pretty much the same thing uh, when we uh, uh, when we get to opening the season uh, we'd like to we'd like to see that uh, same uh, same protocol used in the opening um, with the presets and the uh, fair start provision uh, all those kind of things in place just like the the quality testing uh, and as Dan was saying, uh, um, you know, we're not, we're not in a disaster yet. I appreciate the fact that you're laying the groundwork to get that done. That's greatly appreciated. But, you know, we're, we're not wanting to list this as a disaster uh, yet, at least. Uh, we've got a long ways to go before we get there. We'd rather see a promotion uh, once the the test clear, we'd like to see that big promotion saying, hey, everything's good, crab are safe to eat. Um, we'd, like to, we'd like to see that happen. Uh, we, I appreciate that uh, you're preparing for the worst, uh, but we're gonna expect the best. So we're gonna hope that that uh, continues on. Uh, next slide, and some people aren't gonna like this, but, uh, and I don't know how much input, you know, really the commercial should have on the sports season, although it does impact us. Um, uh, you know, again, I want to reiterate that uh, public uh, health and safety is the number one priority. Um, the con there's a concern in opening county by county. It's been mentioned before that crab don't know where the border stops and they do migrate. And so we could see some cross contamination getting involved. We could see effort shifts. Uh, we could see, you know, people going from one county to another county, uh, which could impact the commercial season in that area. So we're not, uh, you know, we're wanting things to be orderly and uh, open up uh, in, a, in an orderly fashion. We have one minute, Supervisor. Thank you, I'm, I'm just about uh, good. Uh, anyway, and we're not, uh, we're not really support supportive of uh, a big long time before the sports season opens and the commercial season opens. So we'd like to see no more than a week, but, but we're willing to give that week uh, and it may end up being a little bit longer than that, but uh, from the commercial side of it, uh, we'd, like to, we'd like to see that in an orderly fashion. And I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much, Supervisor. Really grateful. All right, we have Mr. Gutierrez here. Thank you so much, uh, representing the Rock Crab Fishery and the Santa Barbara Seafood Station. Ms. Mr. Gutierrez represents both the crab fishermen of Santa Barbara and the wholesalers. Uh, the Rock Crab Fishery is usually a year-round season uh, and was not tested until the Dungeness crab season delay uh, when closures for rock, rock crab were considered. We're grateful that you made such a long trek. And uh, despite what I said earlier, uh, Mr. Hemmingson doesn't get an award today. So, hey, there we go. My goodness. Yeah, it could be close. Hey, there we go. Hey, thank you so much. And you have five minutes, sir. We're grateful that you're here today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wood. Um, I just want to uh, iterate the fact that uh, the California rock crab, especially in Santa Barbara, I've been fishing rock crab for close to uh, 34 years. Before that, I was a fisherman, a diver for urchins and, and abalone and everything else. But uh, one of the mainstays has been rock crab for me and my family. And I just want to iterate that rock crab is not Dungeness, folks. Rock crab is Southern California crab. It is found in San Francisco. It is found in Monterey. But it is Santa Barbara, Ventura, Orange County, and San Diego and L.A. County fish. We don't fish Dungeness. And this came to a surprise for the closure coming at the last minute. We've been doing tests since 1994. I helped the CDCPH form that test in 1994, and somewhere along the line, somebody dropped the ball. That's what I'm, I'm really upset about right now. And I just wanna reiterate, Santa Barbara rock crab is the second largest commercial fishery in the terms of landing, and number three in the terms of value in Santa Barbara Channel. The Santa Barbara Channel has ranked the third most productive area, nine areas of nine areas in California in the commercial fishery. Previously, the rock crab fishery has never been closed due to the presence of DA, domoic acid. Even when the toxin levels were substantially higher in rock crab and lobster, recently example high levels of DA detected in rock crab that resulted only in advisories, not closures. Health and advisory posted in July 2015, 
the rock, rock crab viscera at 100, 140 ppms, 120, 160. Now we were testing six crab at the time and we we're getting nothing but uh, what he caught uh, percentages of how many, how high the crab was. Most of the time we had maybe one crab, two crab high and the rest of the crab clean. Okay, we understand we have to protect the public and rock crab. I deal with the public daily, folks. For the last 30-something years, I've been dealing in crab daily with the, with the public. And these levels for us have always been high. But I also work with the Pacific Rim families, the cultures that know rock crab. They buy rock crab when they hear their advisories. They know exactly what to do, folks. Okay, so we have other samples that, that go on uh, as advisories. Never a closure. And as well in April, December, in, in, in 2013, there was, there was uh, a range of 31 ppms, 216. This is back in 2013. Never a closure, only an advisory. We heard that seals and birds getting ill from these harmful algae blooms. But remember, they are consuming masses, masses of amounts of seafood and sardines that are definitely poisoned by, by these uh, demoic acids. They fall to the bottom. Crabs are scroungers. They eat it. Basically, we think that that's basically where they get the demoic acid. The levels of, of 30 ppm with the results of, 6 point, of 68, 57, and 64 were levels that were considered in the last test that we did in November 3rd. Again, the percentages of the rock crab, there was only two out of six rock crab that actually had these levels. So we're, we're kind of a little in a quagmire here about where do we draw the line? And, and yes, we don't want to poison the public. We're definitely concerned about the public because we deal with them daily. And so we go on. In the last 20 years, there has been not one case of someone being ill, affected or of demoic acid from rock crab. Remember, this is a year-round fishery, not a season fishery. It's been a year-round fishery for as long as I can remember. This June, after rock crab was tested, much higher for demoic acid and only an advisory, not a closure occurred. So why now? Yes, the public health has been testing rock crab. Public health department has been testing rock crab and lobster viscera for many years. And even when samples were found with high levels of demoic acid at times levels exceeding 200, the CDPH only issued an advisory. The fishery has never been closed until this November. We would like to know what the exact process is for declaring an advisory or a closure. There should be a standard operating procedure that defines when such actions are taken. We were never advised about these actions until the last minute. The July advisory was the first mention of the demoic acid occurring in the meat of crab. Since 1994, folks, I've never seen an advisory on the meat of crab, period. Dungeness has. We've never seen anything in the meat. Granted, the health department knows best when they're testing high levels. I appreciate the fact that they're testing the meat finally, even though we told them to please check the meat without cooking it with the viscera. A lot of people in the Pacific Rim know to do that, especially when they see an advisory from the CDPH. Mr. Gutierrez, we have about one minute. Pardon me? We have about a minute. Okay. We have assisted in the biotoxins since 1994, and we continue to participate in such and help inform the decisions regarding this risk of associated with the fishery. We are concerned about the human health and risk in the consumption of our product, but we feel much more information was and is needed to warrant closures of the fishery. I believe the rock crab industry and in partnership with the public health and the Fish and Wildlife Department can manage this resource without getting the public sick and completely shutting down the fishing, causing hardship to the fishing families and businesses. We the stakeholders request that a committee of fishermen, buyers, fish and wildlife, state health department personnel be formed to review all concerns involving both the sampling and the criteria of warnings to the fishery and the public health. I have three points, uh, sir that I would like to uh, issue to the, to the committee. 
direct the State Department that closed this down the fishery, reconsider the closure based on the data provided above. We feel that the closure was unwarranted and that the public health advisory with some added information about risk of exposure is sufficient for keeping the consumers aware of the problem safe and while supporting the continuation of valued state fisheries such as has worked in the past. The Public Health and Resource Agency worked with us for those involved fisheries to standardize the sampling programs and define the process used to define actions regarding the fishery. We also like to involve, be involved with the rock crab fishery to be included and equal providing special, the rock crab fishery should be included with the Dungeness to provide special relief to not only the businesses but to the families and also to the fishermen that so much need this, this relief because we are a year-round fishery, folks. We've been out of work for almost a month. Thank you for your time and your consideration. No, thank you so much. Yes, please, give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. So what we'll uh, do is we have four of the first seven of our second panel that are going to be uh, taking questions uh, from uh, Mr. Wood and myself. I've been keeping track of the items that you had said you wanted to follow up on, which we'll say in just a bit, but I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Wood. Well, yes, and, and first of all, thank you very much, especially, especially who, you who came from long distances to be here. So you actually answered a lot of my questions um, through, through your comments. And, and with respect to Mr. Gutierrez, um, you know, I, maybe, maybe someone on the earlier panel could, could address some of your concerns. Um, at this point, uh, th a lot of this is new information for us. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be one that's going to err on the side of public safety, and I want to understand the science better going forward. So I'm um, going to respect the, de the Department of Public Health. I'm going to respect the, the Fish and Wildlife at this point, and I understand, you understand your concerns. What I don't know, and, and maybe that's a question somebody else might have for me, is is there a significant difference in, in this entomoic acid as it relates to the, to the rock crab industry or, or dungeness? I don't know that. I'm not an expert on crap. So, uh, but I appreciate where you're coming from, and I and I understand that. I also want to say I appreciate the spirit in which uh, Mr. Marshall and Mr. Hemmingson have talked about uh, about the fisheries, and and it, it seems to be a consensus that that you guys would prefer a statewide opening rather than county by county. I understand that, especially since as Washington and Oregon are looking at the same sort of thing. I appreciate that. Also appreciate the proud heritage of fishermen here, and, we're, and I know you're not looking for a handout. I understand completely that Senator McGuire and I understand how slowly the wheels of government move. If we do not take actions to try to help find some relief, even for, for the infrastructure costs, for S potential SBA loans in the future, who knows how long it might take? And so this is not about this is not about a handout. This is about long-term health of an industry that is really, really critical to California. So appreciate this, you know, appreciate the pride and, and and heritage of fishermen. We just want to be sure that that this industry is there next year and the year after. We can't afford to lose this for 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 everyone's sake. So appreciate appreciate where you're coming from. Um, and you know, I've heard actually one of the things I, I want to know is what can we be doing better. Appreciate where you're coming from, Mr. Gutierrez. Um, um, I, if, the other pan, if the other folks, if there's something else that we can be doing better, let us know. Um, if you've got something off the, off the top of your head now, right now, we'll ta I'll take that. But um, we are in uncharted charted territory. And, and one thing I did hear from Mr. Hemmingson is that um, maybe we don't need to be doing this testing every, every year, maybe only when, when conditions actually warrant it. Appreciate that because the last thing we need to do, I think, is 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 have mandatory testing year-round, which is going to be very, very costly, or or season-wise, especially when the conditions don't warrant it. So I want to open it up. There, is there anything else that 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 you see going that we could be doing to 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 help in the future should another situation like this arise? And that's my single question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, to go back to what Mr. Gutierrez was saying, I'd like to say that I share some of his frustration. Um, I understand that their fishery is a completely separate fishery from the fishery that we fish here in Northern Territories. And uh, the proverbial rug was pulled out from under them in the last minute. I think it's safe to say that it's a little bit upsetting that there was an advisory through the summer months, but no closure but with the same kind of levels now in Dungeness and Rock Crab all throughout the state in different areas, they have different levels. I think that basically the reason why it's closed now is because there's a lot of 
a lot of media that are studying this, and it's in the public eye now. It's a much larger fishery in the north where Dungeness is than rock crab. And during the summer months, when it is not of seasonal value, it's not exactly getting the same attention. And it's important to remember that public safety um, issue was there um, during the summer months, and it's been tended to in a different way in different areas, and it should be looked at um, in a very methodical manner so that we approach with caution but not put out any but we don't want to put anybody out of business or stress anybody or cause undue stress to anybody's economic um, status as a result of something that's been being done for as he said decades uh, yeah I'd, I'd like to address the the issue of, uh, of testing as we're getting closer as levels are starting to come down uh, and we're going to want these tests to be done more expedited, uh, if you will. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, if we, the, the, at this point, I think the, the samples have been kind of trickling in, and, and if we start doing these tests and there's 100 crab that are all of a sudden sent to the lab, we think it's going to overburden them. And so if there is a way that you could help uh, facilitate uh, more labs or more personnel uh, to do those tests at at this point in time if these next tests come out to a level that uh, you know could possibly be clean or clearing up uh, dramatically that, that we could see some expedited testing I think would help the, at least the results uh, uh, so we can uh, get an indication of, of when the season could open Great, appreciate you. it yeah I'd like to address the fact of uh, testing also. Uh, like I said, I, I'd been involved with the CDPH uh, since 1994 in testing. Um, a lot, we've been researching with, uh, with the UCSB uh, uh, Professor uh, Carrie Culver. She's a scientist, a marine biologist by trade. And uh, she has worked with uh, different organizations, especially Sea Grant with me for the last probably 20 years that I've known. And, um, She's offered to uh, her facility for testing and stuff, and she's even researched for us to, uh, with a lab that will sell us a test kit so we can do our own testing just to, just to verify our, you know, our findings as far as what the demoic acid is involved, you know, in, our, in our crab. We find in our areas, especially after fishing so many areas myself, I fished the islands, the Channel Islands, every one of them. I fished up and down the coast all the way to, to uh, into, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Morro Bay, all the way down to uh, San Pedro. So the areas do change. Rock crab is definitely different than Dungeness, and we're finding that hot spots are, are in certain areas. Some areas, the hot spots get, they, they clean out the demoic acid a lot quicker than what I've heard from the, from the other marine biologists that we're ta talking about. Uh, right now, we, as you've seen this morning, we do have a hot spot. Uh, it's an area that I've worked before, and I find, my, I find that that hot spot, I'm not surprised by it, okay? But all my other areas are clean, literally. Areas that were 200, you know, maybe 50, and, and all these other numbers that have been thrown around. They're, they're clean now, and that was a week ago. And then, you know, a coast, a coast one that shut us down on November 3rd, right in front of Santa Barbara Harbor, it's clean. The same number, 653, it's clean. 656, it's clean. So we have to have some kind of, what do you call it, uh, committee working with these people, you know, the, the CDPH and the Fish and Wildlife, in order for us to make a, you know, a, a true analysis in rock craft. I'm not talking about Dungeness. I'm talking sure. about rock craft. That's what we need. No, thank you so much. I appreciate the three of you. Um, we'd like to be able to bring up Mr. Bonham again, uh, and as he's making his way up, uh, I'd like to be able to just talk about the follow-ups that uh, have heard from the first part of the panel, uh, from Mr. Marshall uh, preparing worst-case scenario, not pulling the trigger, but just preparing unemployment options as well as SBA loans is what I heard from you. Uh, what I heard from the supervisor is guideline for testing into the future um, and uh, potential e expansion of additional tests with additional labs, so we're not overburdening those that we're already using. And what we heard from Mr. Gutierrez uh, is wanting to be able to be active and engaged on the committee 
uh, that is talking about the potential for closures. And uh, an item that I know what Mr. Bonham will discuss is advisory versus full closure as well, uh, and how that process works and how that trigger is pulled. Um, uh, those are the items. And then obviously uh, on the issue of once this opens, the supervisor stated, uh, making sure that we have um, one, a celebration, but two, I think probably some dollars uh, to be able to market out to the consumer as well regarding the fishery. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it back over to the director to be able to discuss advisory versus closure as well as the committee process. Uh, can you reiterate that here in the weeks and potentially months to come? So thank you, Senator and Rick. Uh, I get your anger. So I want to end by making an offer from our department to your community. But like in a jurisdictional sense, advisory uh, levels, protocol, is an important conversation that must include my colleagues at the Department of Public Health and the Office of Environmental, I always, OWEA, let me mm -hmm. say it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our department can be better. I know we sat down with you and many in your community, more than 30, I believe, through Dr. Schumann and our Santa Barbara office, which is our headquarters for our marine region. So this is local for us. I remind folks that the Fish and Game Code in 7715A says, if the director of OWEA, in consultation with the director of DPH, determines there's a risk, then I may close. I got a recommendation to close. No prudent person would ignore such a recommendation in the seat I sit in. I understand the history here. I do believe you were fishing while an advisory was in place. I'm not sure that history and past practices will always be our best practices going forward given the change we're seeing in the ocean. Here's my offer. I'm not sure committee or not, but I think our department would like to sit down with the Santa Barbara rock crowd, rock crab crowd, and after we get on the other side of this, think through better transparency, better decision making points, better protocol for how we might manage this going forward. So I'm hopeful I can get a yes on accepting that offer. Um, I also believe we're about one month in, I know you have business impact. We're gonna be looking anxiously at the data we'll get next week. We will be discussing in the department tomorrow how you might manage a region where we're looking, heading towards clean, even though we have a hot spot out by San Miguel. I can't make a guarantee, I can't make a promise, but we're thinking through how to get you all back on the water as soon as possible. So that's my offer. Quickly, Mr. Gutierrez, if you'd like to be able to respond, we're just gonna need to be able to move to our uh, next panel. Mr. Director, thank you very much. I have one other question for the director, though, before he leaves. Uh, so a nice handshake right there, Mr. Gutierrez. Uh, Dang, would you like to have mentioned something? I do accept. All okay, right, he right. accepts, so that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate it, really, both of you, uh, for having that conversation. Mr. Director, uh, an item that I neglected to ask you, from clean tests to the, all the departments giving a thumbs up, talk about how long that may take as far as clean tests and then saying to, for example, rock crab or dungeness crab, uh, the industries have at it. Okay, so let me just put an addendum on the exchange we had by saying I know this is doable to figure out a better way because in the immediate aftermath of the refugio oil spill, we sat with y'all and DPH and OEA and we deployed in a way we had never before to get back out in the water, sample a whole variety of fish we'd never sampled before, and get the waters opened as soon as the oil risk was gone. So I know we have the ability to improve together. 
On the recreational front, with the commission, and I don't have total recall, or I didn't pull it up. Just approximate. Uh, the commission wrote in their emergency regulation that when we get these two consecutive clean, and it's memorialized by our public health folks, we can move to open. But we also want to be able to segue through that by giving notice to people, okay? Over on our side, the commercial, uh, uh, I think it can be as fast as in days after, subject to that seven day window and trying to give notice. That's great. I just wanted to make sure, and I apologize I didn't uh, address that before. Thank you so much. Mr. Simon, any other questions? Thank you to our uh, panel A of our second panel. Uh, let's give them a round of applause, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. We now have uh, our final three panelists. We have Jim Yarnell, who is the recreational representative on the Dungeness Crab Task Force. Uh, Mr. Yarnell is the lone recreational fishery representative who's going to be providing testimony today, which we're grateful for. We have Joe Kaido, who's going to be representing, of course, uh, Kaido Fisheries. He's going to be representing the processor component of the fishery, and they are the link uh, between the fishermen and the retailers. And Chuck Capato, president of the Community Fishing Association of Bodega Bay, the CFA support those who currently use more sustainable methods of fishing that minimize bycatch and preserve critical habitat. Uh, a thank you that I neglected to mention in the very beginning. We want to say thank you to the City of Santa Rosa, City of Santa Rosa, for allowing us use at the Steel Lane Community Center. Uh, and by the way, they gave it to us for free. Let's give them a round of applause. My goodness, my goodness. Actually, assuming I think they said we're going to have to bring some crab in once the uh, fishing uh, gets going again. So, all right. But again, thank you so much to the City of Santa Rosa. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's start uh, the second phase of our second panel. Uh, we're going to now introduce Jim Yarnell, who is our recreational representative on the Dungeness Crab Task Force. So, Yarnell, you have five minutes, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair, staff members. Jim Yarnell, longtime resident of Humboldt County and a recreational fisherman. I'm, I am one of two representatives to the Dungeness Crab Task Force, and I'm also deeply involved with Humboldt Saltwater Anglers, which is the northern component of a recreational fishing group, as is Coastside Fishing Group is the southern or uh, northern Bay Area, southern area of the Crab Range. Um, our current role has been, and our position, both Coastside and Hasa, has been safety first. We addressed the Fish and Game Commission prior to their emergency meeting and hearing and stated that we recommended the closure for safety. So we have a common ground with the commercial crowd and with everybody else involved that uh, safety is first. And our role then was to provide outreach to the public because this Fish and Game Commission um, emergency delay in the season occurred on November 5th, just literally less than 48 hours prior to the start. So the timing was really um, tight there. I would just like to say that the recreational fishery is incredibly inefficient when compared to the commercial fishery. The rec fleet takes 2% of the total statewide landings, while for last season 461 commercial boats harvested 98% of that resource. Um, but the wreck fishery also contributes substantially to the economic benefits of those coastal communities. We purchase boats, we have slip fees, we do maintenance on the boats, we buy fuel, gear, bait. Those dollars directly affect those fishing related businesses and also they have multiplier effects throughout the um, economy in those communities. Much harder to measure though is the cultural impact or the cultural value that recreational crabbing provides to those coastal communities. How do you put a price on a family going out on a small boat, setting their gear, catching some crab, bringing that crab back in, cooking that crab, sharing that with family and friends. That experience on the water and consumption of that crab is what defines the culture in a lot of North Coast coastal communities. Just as the people and have noted that 
the lack of commercial crab has been here. Um, and the recreational season also provides, quite importantly, I feel, as an opportunity for lower income families an opportunity to enjoy that crab resource because, quite frankly, they just don't have the financial resources to go down to the fish market and buy enough crab for their families. So the recreational fishery does play an important part in the culture and also economically. Our proposed solutions from the recreational community is simply two things, um, safety first, and also follow the direction of the Fish and Game Commission's November 5th meeting. And that was to open areas just as soon as they became safe, and they have to be safe. Um, I would like to take exception a little bit with the commercial fleet at this point is that um, staying that they must have a statewide rec opener. If you look at the experience of both Oregon and Washington now, both Oregon and Washington now, their commercial seasons are closed statewide, but they also have on the recreational side partial areas of their coastline, some very small. Willapa Bay is closed in right now, but surrounding areas in the ocean are not. So I think if we can look to Oregon and Washington's experience in handling domoic acids, and I think we can do this safely on a regional opening basis as soon as it becomes safe. Um, I also think that there's, in the reopening phase, there should be an opportunity for rec anglers to crab prior to the commercial season opening. The opening dates are intentionally staggered in recreation or in regulations to provide recreational anglers that opportunity to go out and harvest the crab. This year, south of Point Arena, District 10 and south, there was about a one week period. North of that, there was almost three week, over three weeks period of there. And again, we only take 2% of the catch. You have one minute, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one other point is recreational, it's been suggested that a one week opener um, prior to the commercial season. As rec fishermen, we are, have small vessels, weather impacts us dramatically. If you looked at the weather forecast out here, you guys are probably happy you don't have your gear in the water right now up in, off in Northern California. Um, so a one week period, we could get weather events and we'd be completely shut out. So in the future, I would just say um, earlier monitoring and earlier public outreach. And we've been very happy with working cooperatively and collaboratively with staff throughout the state. But the notification, if we can do that earlier in future years, that would be great. So in summary, I would just say um, safety first and follow the Fish and Game Commission's um, recommendations. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for making the drive uh, to San Rosa today. We're grateful, uh, and for your service on the commission as well. Thank, thank you. you. We're now uh, honored to have Joe Kaido here today. He is president of Kaido Fisheries, uh, representing the processor component of the fishery, which is the link between uh, the fishermen and the retailers. Welcome, and we're really grateful that you're here. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Senator McGuire, and Assemblyman Wood for assembling this hearing, and letting me have the opportunity to represent and speak for the processing sector. And also I'd like to thank Director Bonham for taking swift, swift action and delaying the commercial crab season and implementing the testing by the department. I think that's been a tremendous help in the process. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'd like to first tell you a little bit about myself and then what, our, what, our, what our processors do. Um, We've been in the crab processing, ground fish, salmon, king salmon business in California for five generations, dating back to 1885. So we have a long history in this industry and we've seen a lot of changes, nothing like this ever before. This is unprecedented. Um, but to get to the processing angle, we buy crab from fishermen in five uh, ports in California. Crescent City, 
Eureka, Fort Bragg, Bodega Bay, and San Francisco. We also process in three of those locations, um, Eureka, Fort Bragg, and San Francisco. And the, the processing sector processes millions of pounds of crabs a year. We provide different product forms in uh, whole cooked crab, pick crab meat, crab clusters, crab sections, and all of these are all, you know, in fresh and frozen form. And as the season drops off, production drops off, and all of this product is supplied to our customers throughout the remainder of the year. And uh, all of this is distributed by large and whole, small wholesalers, food service distributors, um, you know, th throughout the food chain. You know, all the grocery stores and, you know, restaurants and that whole gamut. And in this industry, it takes a tremendous amount of coordination and hiring of additional seasonal uh, employees to handle the, the volume and the, and to process the amount of crab that comes across the dock every day. I mean, our crews are working 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week when, you know, the volume is high. But for us to be able to do this, we need to be absolutely certain that the crab is safe to eat. We cannot take a chance of making someone ill or having our product recalled or any of that. So, you know, I think we've got to rely on Mother Nature, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Department of Health to give us the green light to go fishing and start the season, whenever that may be. I hope it's soon, um, but time will tell. This being the first year that uh, the season's been delayed, you know, due to the moic acid has had a huge effect on our company, our employees, our customers, the fishermen, and the whole industry um, in general. The fresh and frozen crab sales have just, I mean, dropped significantly since all the bad, mm -hmm. you know, negative uh, press that's been going on. And in fact, we're getting a lot of calls from our service clubs that you know have crab feeds every year. They're not gonna have a crab feed this year. They're gonna you know, do seafood and surf and turf or do something, but not crab. In fact, one of, uh, in Fort Bragg, we, we have a um, Mendocino Coast Clinics has a huge fundraiser every year, it's called, you might know about it, Crab and Wine Days. Well, they decided, and, I, and we're a co-sponsor of the, of, the, uh, of the event, and they're not gonna do crab this year. So it's, it's very concerning to me that when the crab season starts, how's the public gonna react to buying crab? Uh, you know, and I, I don't know. It's 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 a it's a tough thing to think about. But we have about a minute, sir. One minute. Pardon? We have about one minute, sir. I, I'm sorry. Uh, one minute. One minute. Oh, yeah. One minute. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. All right. Um, you know, the industry has already lost its November Thanksgiving holiday sales. We may lose the you know, the rest of the year, Christmas, and, um, and the New Year's sales. And without these high volumes of sales, our companies and companies like ours, our profits are gonna be compromised. Our employees are not working, they're not getting a paycheck. You know, our expenses keep going on and on. And, and, and we just can't make up for the sales this time of year. It just, just doesn't happen. I mean, I'm not looking for any, you know, no, no. Any, but I'm just telling you how it is in, in, in our sector. But I think as an industry, 
we need right now to start putting out some positive press releases about the crab season, the domoic acid, the levels are dropping in some, in some areas, it's clear. We need to be proactive. We need to, we need to gain back the consumer confidence to buy crab. And we need, that's what we do, we need people to buy crab. We have to buy it, we have to sell it, we need, that's the only way we need to have them buy the crab. Absolutely. So. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Oh, that was fantastic, and I just greatly appreciate it. And I think you, you bring up a really good point. And looking to the assemblyman right here, how many crab feeds uh, do you tend every year? Lots. And uh, the reason to bring that up is the industry is severely impacted. But we take a look at the millions that are raised across the state from crab feeds that bring California fresh crab onto the tables. Uh, it's going to impact hundreds of nonprofits uh, across California. Uh, and uh, you bring up a really good point, and uh, I think you probably attend at least uh, two dozen yeah. a year. So uh, lots no, that, of crab feeds. Absolutely, <laughs> but it, you're absolutely right, and the impact that it ha has had. So thank you so much. Yeah. Anything else you would like to yeah, wrap I, up? I just, I would just like to to, to recommend if if you know if the, if the crab season can start before the holiday season. I know the sport, you know, would like to start early, but I think due to this particular time of year, if it can open, I, I would like to see both commercial and sports season start at the same time only so we can take advantage of the holiday season and, you know, all the other people that don't sport fish can enjoy eating crab. That's, that's what I'd like to say. No, I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And thank you so much. I'm going to have you hold there. Give them a round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Great job, Joe. And we are honored that Chuck Capato is here. Chuck is president of the Community Fishing Association, Bodega Bay, uh, giving a perspective here from Sonoma County. Chuck, it's great to see you, and thank you so much for taking the time. You have five minutes, sir. Uh, thank you, Senator McGuire, Assemblyman Wood, Tom, also for having me here today. Uh, I think first it's important to step back and see what really took place here. California set themselves head and shoulders above the rest of the country. We proactively took steps to avoid any type of health hazard. Mm -hmm. Nobody was damaged by this product except the industry that provides it. That's something to bear in mind. Uh, you mentioned crab feeds. These are nonprofit and civic organizations that generate revenue that then they can feed back into their communities to help other people. So the loss is a lot greater than a tourist not being able to get fresh crab That's down at Fisherman's Wharf. What I'd like to do is talk about what's going to happen when we get the green light. We have two major problems. One is public perception. Once we're positive that the crab is healthy to eat, that message needs to be sent out by the top leaders of our state government. The governor needs to proclaim this. We need to make sure that all of our political leaders express the same type of opinion. Once that's done, we can then launch into what PCFFA, Bodega Bay, and other organizations are going to tr try to do. We're going to try to have crab feeds, Fisherman's Wharf, invite members of the media as well as our political leaders to enjoy crab, to rekindle the interest and the confidence in the marketplace that it's there. Joe pointed out a very important thing. Even crab from Washington that was sent down here and frozen crab, nobody's buying it. There's just a hesitance to buy it because of of the, the fact that it might be, or it isn't contaminated, but in their minds it might be. So our public relations efforts are going to take that on, head on. We brought in uh, most of the fishing associations, have contributed money to come up with a, with a public relations firm and to help us spread that message. In Bodega, we're talking about running ads locally in Sonoma County to thank our customers and our citizens for being patient and trusting us and assuring them that we will not catch a crab until we're confident nobody will get sick with it. That brings us to the other issue, and that's marketing. We lost our Thanksgiving market. There's a likelihood we'll lose our Christmas market. We need to roll our sleeves up and embark on an advertising campaign to create markets for our crab. This is we should look at as an opportunity to develop new markets. 
We should call on our congressional leaders to help us, maybe through the Department of Commerce, helping us open up the foreign markets. I'd like to call on the state, because this is expensive. This is beyond the resources of any commercial fishing organization and probably most processors. Media time is expensive. I would like to see if you people could ask the governor to free up some money from the rainy day fund, because it's certainly far less expensive to head off a disaster than pay for one once it happens. In addition to that, uh, I would like to know if there was, would be anything available in the, uh, the community grant, uh, the small town grant program uh, that you just published your flyer about there, Senator Wood. Well, we could, apparently that's been streamlined. There might be money available for that. Or if there's any way we can bring in some money from that California Grown type of program that was on several years ago to help us with this marketing effort. I think the committee should look at taxing some of the best minds we have in the advertising and marketing area to help us with this. None of us are really prepared to take that step. The PR step, we can work with. As far as the marketing and advertising, that's probably belong up below, beyond our level of expertise. Senator, or, uh, Assembly Woods talked earlier about the industry, how it's fragile. I think if you looked at any business and you had two fundamental products, and that's most of our fishing industry. We've got salmon and crab. We're coming off a salmon year that could arguably be one of the worst, with no indication that next year will be better. And now we have a problem with crab. We need to find a way where the sustainability of our stocks go hand in hand with the sustainability of our fishing fleet. We need to find vehicles like larger open access quotas, other, product, other types of species in open access. A good start would to get fish, members of our fishing fleet involved uh, in the, uh, the reconfiguration of the RCA. Right now, that is limited to members of the uh, TMC as well as, tra uh, as well as trawlers. These are the ways that we can make this fleet more sustainable in the future. I've got a couple of cautions that I'm concerned about. We got about one minute as well. Okay. Uh, one is that I think the Department of Fish and Wildlife needs to err on the conservative when it comes to the sports fleet. Uh, there is a minute chance that somebody could get sick from crab. You can't control where the crabs will go. You can't control how much a person will eat. You can't control what they'll eat. So that minute possibility exists. And if someone should become sick from Dungeness crab, it would reflect poorly on the, on the departments. It would also cripple our markets for years in the future. The other thing is that we cannot afford a false start. And when we get the green light to go fishing, the processors may have to be willing to pay a little bit more. The fishermen may have to be willing to take a little bit less so we get our gear in the water and go fishing. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak. No, thank you so much, and well said, absolutely. Thank you so much, the three of you. Uh, greatly appreciate it and well thought out words. Uh, would like to be able to turn it over to the assembly member to kick us off with questions or comments. Uh, just, just comments, and I, what, number one, appreciate, appreciate your, your thoughts, and you've obviously put a tremendous amount of thought into this. Obviously, the loss is, is potentially very, very broad, but it's not just, it's not just commercial fishermen. It's, it's the communities at large. It's the other businesses that, that rely on this. It's nonprofit organizations, and it's, it is a broad, broad issue. And I agree with you. I can understand where public perception of, of, a, of, of a product that's potentially unsafe could be absolutely crippling to the industry. So, so it is indeed a responsibility, I believe, of, of myself and the senator and the state to once this product is actually uh, is safe, that we need to make sure that we, we do what we can to help make sure that people know that. And um, I, I, you know, there's a variety of ways that we might be able to do that. But I would agree that erring on the side of public safety um, and public health is, is absolutely critical because the last thing that an industry like this needs is, is a foodborne illness like this. It, will, it would cripple, cripple an already fragile, uh, fragile industry. So, um, so, so going forward, we pr I really appreciate the, the input and the thoughts and, and, and thank you very much for being here. I'm gonna, let's see if Mr. McGuire has to say here, but really appreciate your thoughts, thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman. Um, I'm going to start uh, just with some words that I said in the beginning is that 
despite the fact that the livelihoods of an entire industry is at stake, they hit the pause button. Because uh, they are focused on the greater good. And how many times, sincerely, how many times have we seen that, where an industry steps up before there is a problem or a potential problem to address it? Uh, and cannot say thank you enough. And I gotta say, it's rare these days that you see individuals putting public safety ahead of profit. And this indus industry has done this incredibly well this year, despite the fact that they are struggling. As we heard from Mr. Marshall, rather than being out in the water, he is working a Christmas tree lot to put food on the table for his family. That's incredible sacrifice. Uh, and just want to say thank you. But uh, as we know, there's nothing more important than the public safety. And I just can't say thank you enough, all of you, uh, because this industry will sink or swim off of consumer confidence. And I also believe, as the, as the member does, that you have the industry that is severely impacted by this closure. Uh, granted, it's temporary still. But we also see impact through our communities with hundreds of deserving nonprofits that are dependent on fresh local crab to serve to their guests during crab feeds all throughout. So uh, again, I, I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you for your words today. Uh, and if it's okay with the assembly, what we'd like to be able to do is give them a round of applause and open up for public comment. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we'd like to be able uh, to do is open up this hearing for public comment. Uh, we are getting the microphone ready to roll. Um, what we're going to ask is if you could please keep your comments to three minutes. Um, we do have one special request. Uh, Carol Hart, who is the director of Sonoma County Regional Parks, is going to lead us off. Sonoma County Regional Parks. Uh, manages Spud Point Arena in Bodega Bay. Uh, there have been impacts by the County of Sonoma, and on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, I know that Director Hart will be uh, speaking on those impacts. Director Hart, we welcome you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Senator McGuire, Assemblymember Wood, uh, and certainly we really greatly appreciate hearing everything and the fact that you've had this hearing today. I want to introduce Regional Parks. We operate Spud Point Marina. Uh, substantial fishing marina. Our marina manager Noah Wagner is here. Many of our fishermen are here from Spud Point. Thank you so much for being here, our berth holders. And I want to speak on behalf of them and probably some of them will be speaking. You heard from Mr. Caputo already. So we have 80 to 100 varies berth holders that commercial fishermen at Spud Point Marina. They're bringing in million pounds uh, to Spud Point, another million pounds, Mason's Marina at our fish buying dock. Uh, very significant and huge impact that we're looking at with the situation uh, with demoic acid this year. Um, as a number of people have said, we've had a greatly reduced salmon season. This was meant to be a good crab season. I haven't heard that yet. But, you know, as crab cycles go, this was meant to be a good season. Pro probably is a good season. Those crab out there are probably doing just great. Uh, it's also been mentioned the loss of Thanksgiving and potentially Christmas puts fishermen on the verge of economic collapse and it's important to look at these long-term effects that are going to go into next year as crab, some of the crab I've heard from fishermen, the crab it will be frozen, it's going to impact the prices going into next year. So this isn't something that's just going to have an impact now, it's going to have ripple effects. Um, also, I want to talk a little bit about the marina because we haven't mentioned that yet. There's a huge impact on our employees, on uh, our revenues, whether it's fuel revenues, fish buying dock revenues, uh, ice. And uh, I will say that the marina has a loan from state boating and waterways. If there is some relief potentially down the road from that loan, for example, this year, we could then pass that on to the fishermen. It's something that hasn't been discussed, but I do think it's something that could be considered because the fishermen are gonna need relief from the birthing, from the birthing rates. Um, they, are, they are gonna be struggling and we want to be able to help them. Likewise, we're big advocates, of course, of a federal disaster declaration. If it's determined that that's appropriate, 
uh, loans for the fishermen, relief to the county, uh, all of these things are critical to us going forward. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify here today, and thank you so much for having the hearing. No, thank you so much, Director Hart, and uh, really appreciate all the work that Sonoma County has put in this put point as well. So thank you so much for your leadership on that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what we'd like to be able to do is open it up. If you could just please state your first and last name. Again, not trying to be pushy. I'll give you a 30-second warning uh, and let you know when you've hit your three minutes. And we welcome all of you to please come and testify. We'd love to hear from you. Good afternoon, sir, and thank you so much for hanging today, uh, and we're appreciative that you're here. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, opportunity. My name is Ben Platt. I'm owner of the fishing vessel Sea Star, a commercial fisherman. I have a 400 trap permit. I have three crewmen hired and on standby for the season, and uh, my business directly supports four families during crab seasons. I have been gathering crabs from the Half Moon Bay area for state testing. I, like most commercial crabbers, strongly favor a statewide opener after all crabs have tested clean throughout our coastal waters. Also, like most of us, I favor a seven-day head start for the recreational boats. However, I think it is a very bad idea to open sub-areas of the waters. <clears throat> to sport crabbers after two clean tests. There is simply unacceptable risks posed to the public's health if crabs with dangerous levels of toxin migrate from adjacent areas into areas open for harvest, and we have no ways of controlling that by, uh, by opening sub-areas. So I, I think we need to err on the side of extreme caution. We've, we're all working really hard to get a good outcome for all of us, and I, I don't think it is, um, it's, it's necessary for a few impatient sport crabbers to go a few days or a few weeks or possibly in our area in Central California months before we get to go because our area has been testing cleaner sooner than other parts of the state. And, we, and I'd also add that there's a much larger sport effort in Central California these days due to the closures in sport rockfish and um, the charter boats are much more involved in, in recreational crabbing than they were, say, 10 or 15 years ago. So I, I do not think it's an insignificant effort on the, on the sport fleet in Central California. Um, but the overriding concern is public health, which we're all trying to safeguard. You have 30 seconds, sir. Um, one thing I've been concerned about as someone who's been testing is that there's a 75-mile uh, stretch of crab grounds between where I have been testing at Pedro Point and the closest areas tested to South Monterey Bay. Maybe it would be wise for the state to have us gather some crabs from the area around Pigeon Point before declaring that the whole area is safe from toxin. That's a, a large area of ocean. Um, one more point I'd like to make is that it looks like the Oregon crabbers will start before we reopen in California. S several large buyers in, or in Oregon have indicated strong demand and a starting price possibly over $3 a pound. This could also help get our California markets back online by the time we start here, by getting people used to buying and eating crabs again. So this actually could help us in California. However, one issue must be clearly resolved by DFW. Will California crabbers be protected with a 30-day fair start clause from boats who are already crabbing in Oregon or Washington? This may become a very critical issue if California is the last state to open. Thanks. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for your words. Good afternoon. Happy holidays. I like the hat. Thank you. True spirit of the, the time of year. Absolutely. My name is Duncan McLean. I'm from Half Moon Bay. I've been fishing for 45 years. Uh, crab for about 43 of those years. And one thing I would like to say first off is that kudos to Director Bonham. I think uh, he's handled this, this situation very well and very positively and very assertively. And he's been very accessible to everybody that I know that's, that's had any contact with him. And um, I think it's gone a long ways to make people feel pretty comfortable with the way things are going. I can't say so much for the Department of Health. Um, I was just on their website and I noticed that they seem to be mixing amnesiac shellfish poisoning with domoic acid, and um, it seems to kind of heighten the, the suspense of what's going on with uh, domoic acid. Um, we were in 1991, I believe it was, that uh, closed until the middle of February in Northern California, 
because of demoic acid. And at that time, 52 parts per million was the uh, standard that was set by the health department. And it was set kind of haphazardly. They just needed some kind of a benchmark to work off of. Uh, it was, like I say, the middle of February before we started fishing. So it was a two and a half month closure that we suffered that year. And it did affect those markets tremendously. You know, at that time we didn't have China online, so it'll be a little bit different this year, but uh, until the health department quits confusing all of these symptoms that go along with amnesiac shellfish poisoning with demoic acid, you know, we're gonna have a very big hurdle there to overcome, and they're gonna have to be one of the first to step up and say that things are clean and it's time to go fishing. And that's critical, it's critical for the buyers, it's critical for fishermen, and it's critical for us to get any kind of a price for it. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. McLean. And grateful that you're here, and thank you so much for taking the time to stay when off your comment. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Welcome, sir, and thank Hi. you so much for sticking around as well. Thank We're you. Grateful. My, my name is Dan Cameron, I'm a commercial fisherman out of Bodega Bay. I have two things I want to say. One is a kind of a rebuttal in reference to the gentleman about the recreational fishery. In this area, in the state itself, there is no accountability of a record as to what their take is. In other words, nobody checks anything at, at the docks. So he's saying they take 2% of the crabs. There's no, there, there's no, nobody knows what they take. They don't even know themselves. And, and salmon is the same way. So he's saying we take 98%, they take 2%. I disagree with that. I'm, I'm, God only knows what they take. It could be 5%, 7%, you know. So, and I'm hoping that with this, they're, you know, they're, they're gonna make an equal fair start for everybody. And, and, and my understanding was, was that they were gonna get seven days before us. Well, they get seven days before us. And, and I would be happy with that. Just give them their seven days and that's it. As far as opening it county by county, I think that would be disastrous for us and the economy. And as far as food and drug goes, I've been in, I, I've been doing the demoic acid tests. I go out and do them when they're supposed to be done. And we did the last test on Saturday. I turned all the product in on Monday. And as far as I know, we still haven't got the results yet. So maybe there's a possibility they might be able to speed that up a little bit too so we can get a little, little further action on it. Thanks for your time. And thank you so much. Sure. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. And as the next gentleman walks to the mic, we encourage folks to come on over. And if you don't mind, uh, just taking a quick stand on the wall, and we'd love to hear from you. Welcome, sir. It's good to see you. Good evening. Uh, Senator McGuire, Assemblymember Wood, thank you for the opportunity to comment tonight. Uh, my name is George Leonard. I'm chief scientist for Ocean Conservancy. We're a national ocean conservation organization that's worked on ocean conservation issues here in California for about two decades. Um, like everybody in the room, Ocean Conservancy is deeply concerned about the delay of the opening of the Dungeness uh, and rock crab seasons. Clearly an important uh, seafood for the state, especially around the holidays, and clearly a critically important economic engine. And we commend the state uh, for its focus on seafood safety. Uh, confidence in the safety of our seafood supply is clearly of utmost importance. Um, and while Ocean Conservancy is really concerned about the current situation, we are especially uh, concerned about the changes in the natural environment uh, that appear to be driving this. Um, as has been said, uh, ocean warm waters are incredibly warm now, uh, and warm waters increase the growth of Pseudonychia. Uh, we know that the waters here <clears throat> are at least uh, partly uh, the result of the blob in combination uh, with El Nino, and perhaps even changes in the uh, uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation. But it's important to recognize that global as well as local ocean temperatures are slowly and inexorably increasing as a result of climate change. And to the extent that water temperature is related to this problem, we should expect the condition to probably be worse in the future, not better. Perhaps most troubling, uh, the issue that we're addressing today may have in fact be ex exacerbated by ocean acidification, uh, which is a different problem uh, in the ocean from, uh, uh, from temperature being driven by climate change. And increasing concentrations of carbon in the atmosphere is changing the very chemistry of the ocean itself, uh, and this is increasing the acidity of the water. Uh, this has been well documented by the scientific community, and in particular by the good work done by the California Ocean Protection Council uh, in close collaboration with the Ocean Science Trust. 
Perhaps most troubling, it may in fact be that increasing ocean acidification over time is going to make the domoic acid problem even worse. And I would point out a study done uh, by David Hutchins in 2012 at the University of Southern California that showed this particular species, Pseudonychia, when grown under low pH conditions, can produce domoic acid concentrations as high as 10 times higher uh, than normal conditions, suggesting that crab will be at risk um, perhaps indirectly uh, as a result of acidification going forward. We have 30 seconds, sir. So uh, I'd like to put forth three specific recommendations that the legislature and the government, uh, the, go uh, the governor could commit to right now. The first is to provide additional uh, resources to both the Department of Fish and Wildlife and to the Water Board for research and qual uh, water quality monitoring on this particular problem right now. But second, I would include, uh, encourage uh, that the Ocean Protection Council receive uh, funding from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund consistent with AB 32 to develop pilot projects uh, to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions uh, and to have uh, impacts on ocean acidification and protect our marine environment and our coastal fisheries. And with respect to future legislation uh, on climate more generally at the state level, uh, I would suggest uh, that it explicitly include oceans uh, as a critical environment that needs to be addressed. It's very clear that we need to invest in the fundamental knowledge and the tools needed to anticipate and adapt to these changing ocean conditions. Today's hearing is but one really good example uh, of why we really need to do so. Thank you. Mr. Leonard, thank you so much. Really grateful that you're here. Thank you. We welcome you, sir, and thank you so much for hanging with us today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Mitch DeArm, and I work at Oliver's Market, a local grocery store here. Hey, good to see you. And the uh, meat department there. And I just want to say a little bit about how important it's going to be for us to change the consumer's mind right now. Because I'm feeling every day of the week uh, scared people who uh, we were able to get a little bit of uh, fresh crab in and they don't want to touch it. And it's not from here and it's not from the areas. We try to reassure them and they just turn it the, the majority, I'd say eight out of 10, mm -hmm. just are afraid. And so to get this turned around so these fishermen can like sell their crab too and we can sell it with them. and. It's going to be really important. It's, it's, uh, the damage seems to have been done pretty severely with the way the media has handled this so far. And so I think creating media that can handle it a little bit more directly, you know, the information being more accurate about what's going on is going to be really important moving forward so that we can, you know, continue the business. It's, uh, that's really all I really want to say because it's been about a 12 to 15 percent loss for us. Really? Um, just over Thanksgiving weekend. And so that's just, you know, a little bit of local news around the whole thing. I just want to thank everybody who's going to go out and take care of this for us and, and looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. No, thank you, Mitch. And I really appreciate your... Yeah, you. I think, uh, similar to Min, I think Mitch uh, reiterates that we're going to need a coordinated effort uh, as we move forward when it comes to the marketing of the California crab. So thank you so much, Mitch. Hey, good afternoon. Hi, how are you doing? My name is Randy Hanna. I'm uh, out of Bodega Bay, uh, Bud Point, uh, fishing boat legacy crewman, and I'm one of three. And uh, I just uh, would like to put a point out of, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading on the internet and surfing through that, and, and uh, I know that you can't believe everything you hear, but um, the, it's affected from California to Alaska, they say, and it's affected. Uh, 20 miles wide and 650 feet deep all the way up the state. How could you assure that uh, a crab out there is not poison going to come into the grounds where we fish and affect somebody, you know? I don't know how you could uh, reassure yourself that every crab out there is going to be clean. And if we get one poisoning, that's it. Um, another thing is uh, last night watching the news, 11 o'clock, I'm not, not sure what channel, two, three, or two, three, or five, one of the two, one of the three, or maybe seven on the news. Um, they had this meeting. They were broadcasting that it was going to be tonight, you know, at this place. And that uh, at the end of the whole thing, they said it was going to be there and everything. At the end of the whole thing, what they said, what the two gals say, I, I wouldn't eat any crap. Are you kidding me? I mean, right away, just the publicity right there that just affected everybody, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, that's all you hear about is poison, poison, poison. I mean, the supply is going to be there, maybe, but the demand's not going to be, you know. Um, another thing is, uh, 
Are the crabs affected? I mean, the other stuff is dying. Are the crabs dying too? They're going to take a hit also, you know? Right. If the crabs die off, you know, that's less, less for the count. I think we ought to relax and just let them have a deer off and, and you know, take a break and, and, and uh, think about this instead of jump back into it and poison somebody. Also, uh, at the end of last year, I fished, 30 seconds, the, I fished in the vessel, and I, after learning about the poisoning, I had a two-week battle, lower GI problem, and I'm a consumer. I'm the cook on the boat also, and I'm a consumer of the crab big time, majorly. And uh, I couldn't hold anything down. I had headaches. I was disoriented. I was stomach cramps. You wouldn't believe it. I mean, I lost about 15 pounds. I couldn't hardly keep fluids in me, and I felt like... Now, hearing about the whole situation, I feel like maybe I had some of the poison. You know, so um, I think we ought to take a real hard look at it and uh, and take this year off because it's it's uh, it's not worth the risk. Of, you know, somebody getting sick or killing somebody. It's bad enough publicity now. I don't know what you could do to restore that. You know, and, and get the people to buy the product. Absolutely, Randy. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here and for your words. Welcome, sir. Really glad that you're here, and thank you so much for your patience today as well. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak. My name is Gary Root, and I own a relatively new company called Same Day Seafood. We're a vertically oriented company. We, we catch our own products, we buy from other fishermen, and we sell it directly to people. Um, the topic of consumer confidence has come up and consumer sentiment several times today. And that's something that we're deeply interested in because it, if we have supply, we need to be sure that the consumer sentiment is there to, to uh, buy it. Mm -hmm. And so we took, took it upon ourselves to do a survey. It's actually an open, active survey right now, and the results are coming in. We've gotten quite a nice response, and there's a little bit of good news in that the survey is coming out fairly positive. The consumers that we've polled um, mainly say that if they're confident in the processes that are established by all the, the departments in the state of California, once the season opens, they will buy local Dungeness crab. We would be happy to share the results um, with various stakeholders. We'd be happy to keep the survey open. We'd be happy to enhance it with new questions um, if that's helpful. So I just wanted to make that open offer to any, anybody in the room. Before you leave, Gary, I'd love to, one of our team members, to uh, give him their card, and we'd love to be able to get that from you, if that's okay. That's, that's fine. Thank you very much. And thank you for your patience. Thanks for hanging with us. Thank you. <laughs> hey, good evening, and again, thank you for your patience. Well, thank you for having the hearing. Uh, I'm Rob Ross. I represent the California Fisheries and Seafood Institute. We have commercial fishermen, processors, buyers, distributors. Uh, Assemblyman Wood, you have said it. Uh, Chuck, you have said it. Senator, we're going to need a Herculean and coordinated approach to reassuring the consumer and the restaurants and the grocers that the product is safe and that which we sell to them, they can sell to the public who will consume it in great quantity with uh, vigor. And uh, you have seen in your experiences coalition letters, and I think we put together a pretty dandy coalition, private, public sector, coalition reassurance so that we're ready to go uh, when the crab are clear. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And uh, absolutely, there's a note that we have both taken that uh, we need to be able to start working on that. So really appreciate and that. And we have done that. We'll share that with the committee and you and look forward to working with you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. But absolutely. The microphone is open. We invite you to please come on up, and if you could just state your first and last. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rick Powers. I own and operate charter boats out of Bodega Bay. I'm also uh, vice president of the uh, uh, Golden Gate Fishermen's Association, which is the Northern California Charter Boat Association. Um, Dungeness crabbing, we've, we've been crabbing for about a little over 20 years now. It's a real, real popular trip. Um, People love it, families love it. Uh, we're missing it greatly. But we also think that it's very important that the public's protected. Um, we are basically the public's access to this resource for people that don't own and operate their own vessels. Uh, we take people out, 
Uh, we catch salmon, rock cod, ling cod, halibut. Dungeness crab has been a big boom, and, and, and we miss it a bunch. Usually November and December we're very busy. This year we're not. Uh, we, uh, our board of directors, um, we think that there should be a coast-wide opener when it comes to the recreational season in order to pr protect the public. Uh, I think that you really need to tread lightly, and, and really uh, a lot of caution has to be taken. Uh, we disagree with uh, small areas opening up just simply because we, we think the public uh, has got to be protected properly. Also, um, you know, in the event, heaven forbid, this re reaches a disaster level, uh, we, we believe that our boats should be uh, considered in that process. We were an integral part of the, um, well, the salmon disaster program along with the commercial guys. Uh, with the, the, the loss of the salmon during eight and nine. Uh, hopefully it doesn't get to that, but uh, you know, our boat should probably be considered too. Thanks. Rick, thank you so much. I really appreciate your patience today. We'll do a last call for comment. We invite you to please come forward. Hey, welcome. It it's Brian good to Pat see you. Kimmy. I, uh, fish up and down the whole coast commercially and recreationally. I stay in squid, anchovies, and also fish crab. Um, in addition to that, every year I go sport fish with my dad on opening day, and I think it should be a coast-wide opener because I don't want a crab from over there wandering over here and myself or my mother getting sick. I think that would just end crab for everyone. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for your patience today as well for sticking with us. Anyone else before we close public comment? All right, we're going to bring it back uh, and uh, offer the Director of Fish and Wildlife any comment that you may have and anything you may have heard. Thank you so much. Um, we'd like to be able to see uh, with public health any items. I know we had a comment in regards to shellfish and crab. Uh, would you like to be able to address that in regards to the tests? I, I believe the comment was related to some, some uh, issues on the website related to amnesic shellfish poisoning. Yep. It's something we'll take a look at. Uh, we do have several programs in the department, as we mentioned earlier. Um, that do try to put information out to the public. We did have to make modifications to the website this year already once re related to the uh, levels of demonic acid in the meat. So uh, we'll certainly redouble our efforts and take a look at the information there to make sure that it's all valid. No, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. What I'd like to be able to do at this time is to offer closing comments and turn it to the Assemblyman and our Vice Chair, Assemblymember Wood. Well, great. <laughs> Maybe I've said enough. Um, no. Uh, first of all, just a thank you. Thank you to everyone for being here today. I know a lot of you travel from a long distance. Um, I think we certainly learned a lot, uh, and uh, I appreciate especially uh, Mr. Bonham and our other other uh, government representatives, people from the people from the state, uh, and all the, the commercial fishermen, the recreational fishermen, everyone who attended here. We have, we've learned a lot. Um, it's it's. Uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, process that we're going through. I hope that this is the, the first and last time we experience something like this, but, but we, we, we realize the importance of, of actually being um, safe for the public. And, and we, we hope, and I, challenge, I, I do challenge the media to, to uh, as, as, this, as this product, as this commodity is safe, to hopefully they will attack the, the, the print media and the, and the uh, television media with the same vigor that they have when, when there is, there is a, there's a public health hazard. So we hope that they will, they will do that. We challenge them to do that. We challenge them to give good news, uh, and, and hopefully that will, that will help. And, and certainly from, from our perspective, I know a Senator and I will, will do what we can uh, to, to promote this product. Um, and you know, I, I, I enjoy crab. I want to be able to enjoy it. I want to be able to enjoy it safely. Uh, and I think that's what everybody wants uh, for the long run. So the, the loss is broad. Um, it, it, it stretches across a lot of sectors. It is not just, it is not just commercial fishermen. It, is, it goes, as, as I said earlier, to nonprofits, to, uh, to, to, gro to grocery stores, to small, small markets. It's a huge, huge impact. And so uh, we appreciate your time here today. Thank you once again. And thank you to all the staff who put this together, allowed this to be live streamed uh, statewide. And uh, I will, at this point, uh, defer to my, my colleague for his closing comments. 
Thank you so much. I uh, greatly appreciate that, Assemblyman. I do want to say, take a moment to thank to the Vice Chair for all of his work uh, leading into today's hearing is for his leadership as well. Thank you so much, Assemblyman Wood. Uh, and I think we need to give him a round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Um, as we heard um, in the beginning, California and crab have a history together. Uh, it's one of the finest delic delicacies that we can enjoy. It's local and it's fresh. And what we want is for the industry to be able to thrive in the months and years to come. So again, I, on behalf of this committee, want to say thank you uh, for your sacrifice. Uh, know that it is a challenging holiday season for everybody in this room. Uh, grateful that all of you have taken the time at your schedules to be able to attend this important meeting providing your testimony and hearing firsthand how this closure has impacted you and how you'd like to be able to see uh, the, the season open uh, and roll in the months to come. I want to say a few thank yous, uh, individuals who made today possible. Uh, first of all, all of you, thank you. And thank you for your patience for sitting through three and a half hours. Uh, so really grateful for that. I want to say thank you to all of our panelists, both the state agency representatives, as well as those who represent the industry. I want to say thank you to the gentleman to my left, that's Tom Westlow, uh, who was the chief consultant. I think we need to give him a round of applause for all the organization. Thank you, Tom. Uh, many individuals uh, have been working hard to make sure that everything went smoothly today, both from the Assembly Member Woods team as well as uh, our team, especially Carlene Rebich. Just want to say thank you so much. And to Carrie Lindecker, I want to say thank you to the sergeants who are here today, as always, for all of your work. Uh, we have our media team uh, that are here. Uh, and just want to say thank you for ensuring that this was going to be live stream. Uh, the city of Santa Rosa, of course, and it would not be... A Merry Christmas and a Happy Hanukkah without having crab on our tables. Uh, and that is what our hope is, is to be able to get this season open here in the next uh, few weeks. But uh, public health comes first. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and grateful for all your work. And thank you. Before you all run off, before you all run off, let's give a, a big round of applause for Senator McGuire and his leadership on this issue, please.